I'm the president and CEO of Empire Management Group. We are a management company here in Central Florida. We manage from Tampa through Daytona, coast to coast. And uh, we are actually, we're here with Alan and Heather Gambini from my team so that we can continue our education that we do not just for our boards, but uh, statewide, whether or not we support you. Uh, we're here to make sure that everybody's getting properly educated for everything that's happening, especially all the changes. Uh, which I know a lot of you have a lot of questions for. Uh, so with that, I wanted to introduce Heather Gambini from my team. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to, um, of course, Alan for allowing us to um, host this evening. Um, we're really excited to have you um, and we hope you enjoy the content that we deliver. Um, we're always here to help and answer any questions, even if you're not a client of ours. Um, so we'll make sure that you're able to um, have some of our contact information. Um, as you can see here, um, um, I'm joined with by Jose and then Alan will give our class this evening. So as we go through the course, um, if you have questions, we'll try to answer them. Um, but that's um, a little bit of intro from us. I hope you enjoy. First, let me get screen share going perfect all right so now that you can actually see what we're here to talk about today uh my name is alan schwartz i thank you I, I won't belabor the point but thank you very much to heather and jose for having us here today uh kben Rembaum's a law firm that's been around since the 90s um we've we've got 20 attorneys including myself eight of whom are board certified experts in this area of community association law one of whom is also board certified in construction law, we've got mediators, we've got a little bit of everything, all pertaining to representation of community associations. Uh, so we're really happy to be here to present this seminar for your education. I'm going to apologize. Uh, usually I'm a little further back on the camera, but I am operating from our Pompano Beach office today rather than my Orlando office. So uh, you might see me a little closer than you want to, and you guys will just have to deal with that for the time being. Uh, as I mentioned, we do but have- that's what it is. Okay. Right. Yeah, sorry. Um, we, we have offices, like I mentioned, in Pompano Beach. This is our main office that I'm in today, um, visiting my parents, to be candid. We've got offices in Palm Beach Gardens. My office is in Orlando. We're also in Tampa. And as, uh, as much as some people may not uh, want to admit it, we also have an office in Miami. Uh, so thank you all for attending today. I'm not going to waste your time. We've got a ton of slides to get through. Um, and I do think that we'll have some time for Q&A. We'll also have some time, as advertised, to give a little bit of an update on some of the statutes that have changed or are changing this year pertaining to homeowners associations in particular. So with that, without further ado, uh, we will talk through all this. As Jeff mentioned, if I go too fast or if I skip over certain portions, it's just because we don't have time to go slowly or go through everything. As Jeff mentioned, also, you will have the slides available at the end of the presentation. So don't freak out if you're sitting here and, and you can hear already I'm talking a little fast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Why are we even here today? Well, there are two reasons you might be here. One is you are on the board of your community association and hopefully an HOA. Otherwise, some of this information might not be that helpful to you, uh, but you're welcome to stick around anyway or you intend to be on your board and you just kind of want to get some information. And I think that's a fantastic idea. So there are two different ways that you can get certified as a director, which needs to be done within 90 days after you are elected or appointed to the board or up to one year in advance of becoming a director. One way is you come to a class like this is the best way to do it because you're getting actual education. You're learning and understanding what your responsibilities as a board member will be. And you're hopefully going to take this information and use it rather than just making emotional decisions and things of that nature. You're going to understand by the end of this course, your responsibilities, and that part of that responsibility is to run a corporation, which your community association is. So the alternative is you can submit a certificate in writing to the secretary that you basically read the governing documents. You'll uphold the documents to the best of your ability and you'll faithfully discharge your fiduciary responsibility. We'll get into what that is later. 
to the association's members. The problem I have with this second option of not taking this class, and I understand I might be preaching to the choir a little bit because if you're already here, you're already taking the class. But I want you to explain to any of your directors of your community that aren't taking a class like this, that what they're doing is reading governing documents that even your attorney is going to have difficulty interpreting. So those documents are generally pretty poorly written unless they've been drastically amended. They conflict with the other governing documents between the bylaws, the articles, the declaration, the rules and regulations. You've got rules that are not actually supported by the governing documents, et cetera. And so it's a better course of action in my perspective to have attended a class like this and get some actual education and knowledge. And again, thank you to Empire for giving everyone that's on this class that knowledge, whether it's through me or not. So the certification doesn't have to be repeated. It's good as long as you stay on the board without interruption. Without interruption means if you're suspended, technically you're not off the board. You're gonna come back. If you are pulled off the board or if you, if you uh, decide to drop off for even a minute, you need to retake this class or sign the certificate and in my opinion, make an, a mistake and uh, do something that's not in your or your community's best interest. Now, if you don't do this certification, whether it's via the written certification or the certificate you'll get at the end of this class, within the 90 days after you come onto the board, you are automatically suspended. When I say automatically, I mean, it doesn't matter if the other directors want you to be suspended or not, you're technically suspended and the board can temporarily fill that spot. So that's what a suspension is. You're off, but if once you do what you're supposed to do, or the issue that's causing you to be off the board and suspended, you come right back. There's a big difference between that and formally being removed from or deciding to drop off of the board. Now, this written certification needs to stay in the association's records five years after the election or the duration of uninterrupted tenure. In other words, for as long as you stay on the board, whichever's longer. In other words, I don't care how long you're on the board. While you're on the board, don't let this thing this certificate that you'll get at the end of today come out of the association's official records. This is the way that you're going to prove that you've done what you're required to do under Florida law. Okay, failure to have the certification or educational certificate on file doesn't mean that any decisions you made, in other words, if you attended a board meeting and you voted for something, that doesn't invalidate anything you've done. Okay, you didn't do it the right way but it still stays in place. If you voted and you realize after, let's say six months, oh, I didn't certify, okay? Anything you did within those three months between the 90 days that you were supposed to do it and the time that you actually realize it and take care of it is still valid, okay? So I don't want you to think that when I say you're suspended, it means that anything you did doesn't matter anymore. That's not what I'm saying. It means that if anyone on the board realizes it or any member realizes that you didn't do this certification within the time you're allotted, you technically should be off the board without any decision being made. It's just a, sorry, you know, you're suspended until you complete this requirement. So there are a lot of generalities that are listed in the first few slides here. I'm candidly just gonna skip through a bunch of them because the information is included elsewhere in our presentation, but we like to include this up front so that anyone that's taken our classes can kind of have an easy reference point. Um, so. It's just something that we're providing for that purpose, not, you know, you're not missing anything as we skip through these. Okay, so one of the things I will mention, and this is kind of a, a preview of what we're going to talk about later, as of, and Heather, we talked about this earlier today, uh, as of October 1st, you do need an agenda for every board meeting. That's not something that's been required before, but if you're looking at this little slide here, you do need an agenda for every board meeting, even in an HOA, not just in a condo anymore, effective October 1st of 2023, the year this is being recorded. So just note that right now you don't need it. I highly recommend that you start doing it now so that you don't screw up when the time comes. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So absolutely. Um, this is something that we anticipated, of course, for a long time, um, and it's, it's here now. So we're definitely gearing up um, our managers to get ready to um, put these agendas out. I know a lot of us had the um, in the sign staked in the ground um, with just some writing on it saying this is when and where the meeting is. Um, so we're going to have to deviate from that a little bit. Of course, you can still put those signs there, but also post an agenda as as well. Agreed. Thanks, Heather.
All right, so again, we're gonna skip through some of this because we will go through it later on. All right, now we get back to the substantive information here. So you're governed as an HOA by at least two statutes. There are other ones that are gonna apply, but when it comes to Florida law, the biggies are chapter 720 of the Florida statutes. That's the HOA Act. So that's the big one that you're gonna look at and say, most of the things that we're gonna to wanna to do or wanna be governed by, or we're gonna to have to deal with are gonna be governed by that chapter of the Florida statutes. Again, that's 720, okay? It's basically saying there have been HOAs in existence as a matter of contract law and a matter of what might be recorded in the county public records for a long time. Now the statutes are gonna start regulating it. Okay, so this HOA statute didn't always exist. Previously, it was just chapter 617, which is the other one mentioned here, and that's the not-for-profit statute. So there are some things that I'll mention today that a lot of even attorneys, let alone a lot of managers and directors, and I'm not counting Empire in that because we've talked enough that I know Empire's managers are aware of these things, but a lot of people don't know that chapter 617, the not-for-profit statute, also governs community associations and HOAs in particular. So the, the big takeaway here is you're subject to both. If those statutes conflict, and we'll get into governing documents conflicting later, but if those statutes conflict, meaning that the HOA statute says one thing and the uh, corporation statute, the not-for-profit statute says the exact opposite, chapter 720 is the more specific statute governing your community, and it will always govern over 617. That's directly written into the law. OK, so I'll skip the, the purposes of Chapter 720, but just understand it's the statutes that govern HOAs and POAs in Florida. And when I say HOAs, I hope that everyone that's on this call understands, I mean, homeowners associations, POA being a property owners association. Which year statutes apply? That's another question that we have to answer when a lawyer and keep in mind, this is what your lawyer is going to do. I'm not expecting any director to try and make a determination and frankly, any manager to do the legal analysis of what year statutes apply. So these are the types of things you should be going to your, your attorney for. What I want to make sure you understand is how it's going to work when you go to your attorney. What are they going to be evaluating? Okay, I'm not asking you to do this analysis just to try and understand it a little better. So contract law 101, any law that's in effect as of the time a contract is entered, and keep in mind your declaration, your CCNRs, whatever you want to call it, that's a contract between the association and its members. It's a recorded contract that governs the entire community. Okay, so whatever law is in place as of the date that the declaration was entered, in your case, the declaration was recorded, is the law of the land. And when I say the law of the land, I mean the law of your community. Now, there are things that can go into your declaration that might change that, which we'll talk about in a sec. Okay, constitutionally, the U.S. and state constitutions protect you from retroactive application of laws. Now, when I say retroactive application, what I mean is the legislature changed. Statutes were amended, okay? But they won't apply to your community if they adversely affect or destroy a vested right. We'll talk about what those rights might be in a minute. Or they impose or create a new obligation or duty in connection with a previous transaction. In other words, the association already did something, all of a sudden they're responsible for something else or your members are responsible for something else that wasn't contemplated at the time or that imposes new penalties. There's a new law that says you get fined automatically for X. Well, it might not apply to your community if it's not in your declaration or your declaration doesn't contain this language, Kaufman language. Okay, Kaufman is the case we're talking about. Kaufman versus Shear is a case that basically decided if the declaration provides that it's subject to the Florida statutes, the HOA Act, the Not-for-Profit Act, whatever the statute may be, as amended from time to time, this purple language that's in the slide, okay, if that language is there and, and the governing documents say they are subject to the statutes as amended from time to time, that is like magic language. It's music to my ears. Okay, if that's the case, you don't really need to do this analysis for the most part. Every year's legislative changes apply as if those recently changed re recent changes were drafted into the declaration. Okay, if you don't contain this language, which frankly, most community association, most HOA declarations do not. This is more of a condo thing, but we do see it in HOA governing documents. Okay, if your governing documents don't say this, if they don't incorporate the statutes as amended from time to time, 
you you look to does the legislation itself say whether it's retroactive if not probably isn't it's meaning the former statute is going to apply if it's not retroactive or if the statute is silent on that issue are the changes substantive meaning they affect an existing right responsibility etc or is it a procedure that's changing in other words if we look at just fines for an example and we'll get into my opinion on fines later substantive is how much can you find right now it's a hundred dollars a day for up to a thousand dollars for each instance unless the governing documents say otherwise okay if that suddenly changed to a thousand dollars a day under the statute that's a substantive change in a penalty okay substantive means material if we were changing the way that you levy fines that's procedural in other words that meeting uh the board meeting the notice of another uh, committee meeting, et cetera. That procedure, if it changed, would be procedural. If it's procedural and there's no language, the Kaufman language is not there, the legislation is going to apply. Okay, That's less of a vested right, and that's the reason. If it's a substantive change and you're affecting a substantive right, I know I'm using that word a lot, that's on purpose. Okay, More likely than not, the new legislation won't apply because it's a constitution, an unconstitutional uh, action of the legislature. Okay, you can't assume, bottom line, that your declaration or the statute is always going to control in any spe specific situation. So these are, again, situations you'll run by your attorney. We're going to skip some of this. Um, we, I just gave kind of an example and an explanation, so we'll skip through a little bit of this. Uh, let's see. So conflicts between, I mentioned, there are almost always going to be conflicts between your governing documents and the statutes. So where there's a conflict conflict between the declaration bylaws or articles, what do you do? Just remember the old expression, a little dabble do you. Declaration, then articles, then bylaws. So let's briefly go through what each one of these is and what it's going to entail so you know where to look when you're reviewing the documents that, frankly, no one's able to read. Your declaration, your CCNRs, that's basically going to be the constitution of your community. It's how everything is supposed to operate, what people are allowed to do on their property, what rights the association has, can they enter onto your property, can the association perform self-help, what is a violation, what enforcement mechanisms exist, how do you levy assessments, things of that nature. That's generally going to be what's in your declaration. Okay, These declarations are presumed valid, anything that's in there is presumed valid, unless it's arbitrarily enforced or it's already uh, in case law, it's already been decided that you can't have that provision. The reason for this is that the members vote on almost any change to the declaration, unless it's developer control. So the members have the right to say, I don't want this in my declaration, or I do want it. Majority rules in that respect, unless your governing documents say you need, let's say, a two-thirds vote of the members to alter this, a 75% a vote, whatever it may be, okay? Your articles of incorporation are next in line of importance and presumed validity. That's basically going to say the name and the purpose of the corporation. Again, you are running a corporation. I'm going to repeat that throughout the presentation today. Um, it's also sometimes going to include some of the information you would normally find in your bylaws. Your bylaws are generally going to be where your procedure is found, where your, um, you know, what each director and officer is obligated to do, what tasks they're responsible for, et cetera. Um, your rules and regulations, those are generally going to be board made with, with or without member approval. So they're scrutinized a lot more closely by the judge or the court, whatever the situation may be, because the members didn't necessarily even have any input in creating those rules other than the 14 days notice of a board meeting where the board can frankly ignore everything that the members say that that the members don't like that's going into these rules and regulations that they'll be subjected to. So keep in mind, again, declaration, articles, bylaws, rules, and regs in that order. Okay, we're going to move into transfer fees and estoppel certificates. So every segment we get into, we're going to break down a little bit of what we're talking about. This one, uh, we talk about transfer fees. Transfer fee covenants violate public policy. Bet you didn't know that. Um, it impairs the marketability and transferability of the property. So it's considered an unreasonable restraint on alienation. Alienation means your ability to do what you want and get rid of your property, rent it out, et cetera. But bottom line, it's allowed in a community association if it's in your governing documents. 
Okay. Keep in mind also, the um, following items are not considered transfer fees, so they're not prohibited. Any fee charge, assessment, fine, or other amount payable to the association pursuant to the governing documents, including payment for estoppel letters or certificates, um, charges imposed in, in covenants that are encumbering four or more parcels in the community. When I say encumbering, I mean it basically constitutes a lien against that property and it, it governs that property. Uh, and payable to a nonprofit or charitable organization to support these specific purposes. So again, an estoppel fee is allowed. You can charge in order to tell someone, here's what you need to do in order to take clean title, so to speak, to this property. So when you get a request for an estoppel certificate, and if you've got a management company, they're gonna handle this and they're gonna handle it very well because they handle it every single day. Um, within 10 business days after you receive the request, you need to provide the estoppel certificate. Okay, the estoppel certificate is basically a piece of paper that says what's due for assessments, what's going to come due for assessments while that certificate is valid. That period is going to be 30 to 35 days, depending whether you're emailing, faxing, or 35 days if it's mailed. Um, it's going to say what violations are on the property, et cetera. The biggest and most important part of an estoppel certificate that you need to understand is anything that's not included in it is waived. There is an, a legal concept called equitable estoppel, promissory estoppel. That's where this, the name of this document comes from. And it basically says, if you tell me this is all I need to do, and I close in reliance on that statement, and the statement here is just your written estoppel certificate, I have a right to rely on what you told me I needed to do in order to have you know, a, a clean slate when I buy into this property. Okay. There's no previous assessments as long as they're paid in accordance with the certificate. There's no violations as long as they're cured in accordance with the certificate. Any upcoming assessments might need to be listed on there as well if you've got special assessments coming up. If you don't list, let's say, you know, an initiation fee or um, capital contribution fees and things of that nature, you may be waiving all of that. So you want to be very careful. Another thing that I see coming up. I've never had it come up with Empire, fortunately, but other management companies and especially individual CAMs that are representing just one community. Um, I've seen where they don't ask for attorney's fees and cost figures when they are giving figures to the owner. They don't have up-to-date interest figures. They don't have up-to-date interest uh, late fee figures. They don't ask about what payments have been made to a law firm after the account's been turned over. Well, if you're giving inaccurate figures, you might be in trouble with Fair Debt Collection Practices Act issues and the Florida equivalent FCCPA. But almost more importantly, regardless of whether, whether anyone decides to raise a claim, you might be writing off all of those attorney's fees and costs and not on purpose. So you need to make sure and, and management, if there are any other managers on here, whether you're with Empire or not, make sure if an account is in collection or enforcement with an attorney, before you ever issue an estoppel certificate, reach out to the attorney and make sure your information is up to date. That's one of the biggest problems that I've seen. I haven't seen it frequently lately. I think everyone's kind of gotten up to date on the issue, but I was seeing it happen fairly frequently back in 2015 and 16. And it was a big problem because these people were writing off thousands of dollars of attorney's fees, frankly, for no reason other than a mistake by the manager. Uh, the estoppel certificate needs to be signed by an officer or authorized agent of the association. That can be your manager if you have one. Um, it is crucial to handle these as soon as possible. The other thing that I've seen, even if you're providing it fairly quickly, uh, is that if you don't provide it within the 10 business days, the legal ramification is that you don't get to charge for preparing it. But in reality, I've also seen people claim, well, you didn't provide the estoppel in time, so we couldn't close. So all of my lost revenue from the sale, if, if the sale was canceled or terminated, or my lost rental income for the last 10 days until you actually provided it, you need to pay me that. Why even deal with that? Provide it with, you have 10 business days, that's two weeks. Just take care of it. Okay, moving on now that I've off my soapbox a little bit. Uh, this is the general information that's going to go into this estoppel certificate. I won't go into it in detail. The statute is very clear and the information that's in here is pretty much word for word what's in the statute. So if you want to take a look, you're welcome. This is all assessment information, which I mentioned. 
other information that goes into it, uh, whether there's a right of first refusal is a big one that I didn't mention yet. Uh, rights of first refusal are essentially, does the association get to say, no, I don't want this person buying in, we'll offer a separate buyer or we'll buy it ourselves as a community association. There are different ways that can be worded, different ways that it can work, just depends what's in your governing documents. It's not going to exist this right of first refusal unless it's in your governing document. So again, you know, you can probably find it without the help of an attorney, but you might need an attorney to interpret it. Um, and anytime I say, you know, you might need an attorney, obviously I would be happy if you reached out to our firm, even if you're not a client and um, you know, we can make that happen. But the purpose here is education. So I wanted to mention that once. I'll try not to mention it again today. Um, no delinquency. In other words, if they don't owe anything, the fee can't be more than two ninety nine. dollars And I know, Heather, we've discussed this in the past, that it was $250. Uh, it has been up to $299, effective, I think, about six months or a year ago. Uh, I'm not anticipating that'll be increased again until at least 2027, which is when the legislature is required to revisit this issue. Uh, if there is a delinquency, you can add 150. That's basically going to be your attorney's fee or your management fee that is going to be charged to calculate the appropriate balance due. Uh, if you are involved with counsel, your attorney should probably be preparing the financial form of that estoppel certificate, by the way, if you have an account that's in collection. Uh, if it's requested on an expedited basis, that's another 119 that the association can charge. And all of these charges, by the way, need to be listed in a resolution of the board. Um, so just make sure that either there's a contract that says management can charge X dollars for preparation of an estoppel, or you've got a formal resolution. So the contract replaces that resolution because it's already been approved by the board if you've approved the contract. But if you don't have a manager uh, or if your manager works directly for you, not via a contract, or if that contract doesn't say what the management firm gets to charge, you're going to want to have a resolution of the board prepared, signed, adopted, et cetera. Uh, I mentioned if it's delivered late, you can't charge a fee for preparing it. You can see this could get a little bit um, costly to the person requesting this. Well, it's not if you wait more than the 10 business days because you can't charge anything if you do. So just make sure to provide it on time. If there are multiple properties, there are different rates of what you can charge instead of a, you know, the, the 299 per property. These are limitations. You can still charge the additional rush fee. You can still charge the additional delinquency fee. Uh, but the general fee for up to, you know, these amounts, and I, I won't go through them in depth, but just know that there, if, if someone is requesting an estoppel certificate for multiple parcels, these fees are going to apply. Now, reimbursement, what this basically says is if the transaction isn't concluded in the time when the estoppel is good, um, the person who paid for or requested the estoppel can ask for their money back. You do have to pay that. Most people don't realize it. It needs to be, it needs to be refunded within 30 days after the request is made. The request needs to be no later than 30 days after the closing date that was scheduled. Now, I've seen people get around this by telling you that the closing date is six months from now and then closing a week from now and, and asking for an updated estoppel. Um, I don't like that, but I've seen it happen. But the bottom line is that person is entitled to get their money back. The association can then say, OK, we're tacking this onto the ledger for this particular parcel as the equivalent of a, an assessment. It's a lienable, I won't say offense, but it's a lienable charge. So just understand. Um, you know, if, if someone asks for their money back within 30 days after that transaction was supposed to close, you may not realize that they are entitled to those funds. You just tack it back onto the account. Um, there is a statutory fee entitlement. If you file a lawsuit about whether an estoppel should or was should be or was not issued or whether the estoppel certificate contains accurate information, there is an entitlement for the prevailing party, meaning whoever wins, to recover their attorney's fees and costs. So you don't wanna get into that lawsuit and end up losing it because you didn't provide the estoppel in time. Um, again, adjustment is every five years. It was just done last year. So expect in 2027. 
The effective period I mentioned, it's either 30 or 35 days, depending whether you deliver it quickly by mail or hand delivery. Um, if you're delivering it by any means that is just mailing, it's 35 days, otherwise it's 30. If you find new information that makes it invalid or you made a mistake, you do need to issue an amended certificate. You cannot charge for that amendment. And that amendment is in turn good for 30 to 35 days, same calculation from the date that the amended certificate is issued. So you're going to basically be extending this time frame out without being paid any, anything extra for it. Bottom line, make sure to get it right the first time. You won't have to worry about it. Uh, and again, anything that's not listed in the estoppel certificate, you won't have the right to collect. So if you make a mistake and you notice it, make sure to get that amended estoppel certificate out. Okay, uh, other information that's being requested, you can charge a reasonable fee to a prospective purchaser, lien holder, including a mortgagee, uh, the current owner or a member for providing a good faith response to a request for information um, other than what's required by law, so long as the fee doesn't exceed $150 plus the reasonable cost of copies and attorney's fees incurred by the association. So this is where someone is asking for information re regarding a sale that isn't an estoppel certificate. It's not information that they're necessarily entitled to, but you're providing it anyway um, because it's in your official records and why not provide it? Uh, that also includes some of the lender requests from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, following some of the changes that were made in condo world. I won't get into those in detail, uh, but we'll probably end up having, and, and we've had multiples with the legislative changes this year. You should look out for several classes regarding, if, if you're interested in condo world, uh, regarding the legislative changes to condos, because I think out of 70 something pages of our legislative update, about 50 of them pertain only to condos this year. Um, and then this talks about also residential sales transactions. It's the seller's duty to provide the buyer notice of all hidden defects, not the association's responsibility. Okay, if you know that there's a problem that's going to need to be fixed, you might be obligated, you might want to run that by your attorney. Use right suspensions, voting suspensions, and fining. I like these a lot, so let's go through them. Uh, you can suspend the right of an owner to use your amenities, whether you've got a clubhouse, a pool, whatever, tennis courts, whatever you might have on property. Um, or you can potentially suspend the right of that individual to vote or that lot to vote if they are delinquent in um, compliance with the governing documents. So we'll get into monetary suspensions in a minute. This is specifically regarding non-monetary violations. Okay, the process Essentially, the board decides, well, we're going to fine or suspend use rights. You have the opportunity to attend another meeting with a committee that is comprised of members of the community that are not the board, not the officers, not managers, and not any of their spouses. Nothing in there really says it can't be someone who happens to live with them, but none of their spouses uh, and certain other people in their families. Okay, you're going you're gonna to offer that meeting that should take place no sooner than 14 days after the date of the notice that you're going to send out after your board meeting. If that committee that needs to hold the meeting holds the meeting and says, nope, no fine or no suspension, we don't think what they did was worth uh, a suspension, the bottom line is there's no suspension, there's no fine. They've made their decision. If their decision is, yes, we're going to fine, we're going to suspend, and the board notifies the owner of the suspension and anyone else that might be subject to it, notifies the owner of the fine, and then it's imposed. So again, if that committee can't be embodied because you don't have anyone in the community that's willing to do it, or if the committee is embodied and they say no fine, no suspension, there is no fine or suspension. It's only if you go through this entire process and all the way through, everyone says yes. Okay. There is a question of whether you need to hold that meeting or just offer one and say, well, if you don't respond within 14 days, we'll presume that you don't intend to fight this. I've always thought that it's the safer course of action and less subject to challenge to actually hold the, the committee meeting. But that's a board decision is the bottom line. Um, so moving along and, and we'll get into fines now, which I think fines are a great tool if you are using them right, appropriately. 
The right way to use fines is not to levy the fines, go through this entire process I just described, and then let the fines sit on the owner's account for five years until they expire under Florida law. The right way to do it is if you're going to do it, levy the fines and then file your lawsuit to collect them. Okay. I, I hate when a board that is completely credible otherwise and, and does what it's, pardon me, does what it says in every other instance, levies fines and then just lets them sit around. What you're telling your members is there's no teeth to anything that we're telling you. Let's just, let's just pretend that we're going to go after you for this violation. Okay. Again, same impartial committee. The board has a meeting. The impartial committee offers or holds a meeting no sooner than 14 days later. And then they decide whether to levy the fine. If they levy it, the board notifies them. Your governing documents, most likely your bylaws, might also have this procedure in there. It might be slightly different. Um, you know, run it by your attorney at least one time to verify which procedure the statute or your bylaws is going to apply to your community going forward. Keep in mind a fine can't exceed, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but it can't exceed $100 per violation unless otherwise provided in the governing documents. And if it's an ongoing violation, then it can't exceed $1,000 per violation in the aggregate unless the governing documents say otherwise. And then a fine of $1,000 or more can become a lien against the parcel and collected through that lien foreclosure process if the authority to do that is in your governing documents, in your declaration in particular. So if your, your declaration says you can levy a fine, but doesn't say you can lean for it, you probably can. So, and I'm not suggesting that you amend to lean for it because let's be realistic. Do we really want to foreclose someone's house because they wouldn't take their trash cans in or they wouldn't paint their mailbox? Because that's really what we're talking about. The better course of action, in my opinion, has always been go through your standard enforcement process of one, two, three letters by management a letter and then um, an offer for pre-suit mediation by your attorney, possibly a self-help demand, meaning that you're telling the owners, if you don't cure this violation, we'll come on your property and do it for you and charge you the cost. If that's supported by your governing documents, and then if that self-help is not successful and you don't reach a resolution beforehand, filing your enforcement lawsuit and seeking an injunction or another remedy and forcing the owner to comply with the governing documents going forward. So, I'm not opposed to fines. I'm opposed to the way most people do it. So do it the right way. We'll be on the same page. Um, in other words, go after it. Don't just write it off when they send an estoppel request or wait the five years until it expires under the statute of limitations. Uh, fines are due five days after the date of the committee meeting and the notice. So make sure that you're actually sending out some kind of notice saying, hey, we find you, you got to pay this, not just kind of letting it sit. Use right suspensions for monetary obligations. Okay, so if it's 90 days or more, or greater than 90 days, actually, let me state that correctly. If it's more than 90 days delinquent, in other words, it came due January 1st, your governing documents say it's delinquent after 45 days. Okay, we're not saying 90 days after January 1st. We're, 90, we're probably saying 90 days after that 45 days. Okay, it's failure to pay a monetary obligation for greater than 90 days. Talk to your attorney about how to interpret that as well. Uh, but the board can actually suspend the use rights of an owner at any board meeting after that. Okay, so you need to be 90 days delinquent in any monetary obligation. That's also where fines can come into play, by the way. You, you were fined, you were notified that you were fined, and you didn't pay it for 90 days. Okay, your use rights are suspended. When I say use rights, I mean you're suspending the ability to use those amenities I mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, the motion can be done one time for all of your lots if it's done properly at a properly noticed board meeting. You might not want to do it that way because you might want to give everyone the opportunity to actually cure their violations instead, but that's up to the board. Okay. Uh, another avenue that I recommend looking into if there is a monetary obligation that hasn't been paid and you're in a rental community or the property is rented, at least on a long-term basis, this doesn't really work with short-term rentals, but you can send a rent demand notice to the tenant and they're obligated to make their next rent payment and every rent payment thereafter to the association unless and until the association says, all right, this is paid up. By the way, make sure to send that notice saying it's paid up so you're not getting payments you're not entitled to. Okay, moving along uh, for pretty much any purpose, suspensions don't apply to the portion of the common areas used to provide access to the lot 
or utility services. I get the question, is the internet a utility service? It's becoming more and more of one. I don't know that it's been formally found in an HOA context. In a, in a condo context, I believe it has been found by the DBPR to be a utility for this purpose. Okay, so just be careful. I wouldn't shut off internet and I specifically wouldn't do it if you are offering internet as um, part of something that people are paying for separately. So you might not have that right at all if they are paying, even though you have a bulk agreement with a, uh, an internet contractor, if each individual unit is separately paying for their internet, you might not have the ability to shut that off or you might not have the right to shut it off for any individual lots. Uh, you also can't block vehicular and pedestrian ingress to and egress from the parcel, including, uh, including the right to park. What this means is you can't say you can't get into the community. If you have a gate, uh, you can potentially, although there's some risk associated with it, you can potentially shut off key fobs, require that they go through and, and show ID to the guard, et cetera. Um, I've seen that go both ways. Most of the time, judges understand you're not cutting off ingress and egress. You're cutting off one method of getting into the community. So that is something that can be very useful, especially, and you'll excuse me, but when one spouse found, finds out that the other one didn't pay, or the boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, or the roommate finds out that the other person didn't pay the association or is in violation, this is a very quick way to get everyone into in line um, because it, it basically makes sure that everyone knows, hey, you know what? You want to inconvenience all of the members of the community by violating the covenants? Okay, we'll inconvenience you right back. Moving on, uh, voting suspensions might need to be in your declaration. There is a condo case that's there in blue, the De Soleil case, that basically says if the declaration was recorded before the amendment that allowed for voting suspensions, and when I say the amendment, I mean the statute, um, you might not be able to do this, these voting suspensions. Keep in mind also, if you suspend voting rights, which by the way is done the exact same way I just described, that same board meeting, 14 days, another meeting, notify. Um, you know, if this is done, also be careful because those votes don't count for any purpose going forward until the suspension is lifted. What that means is it might actually be harder for you to accomplish a quorum of members at a meeting, at a member meeting, um, and you might have a harder time getting votes. They don't count at all. So instead of having 100 potential members attending and voting at a meeting, you now have 99 if you've only suspended one, one voting right. Um, keep in mind also, when we talk about suspensions for monetary obligations, that suspension doesn't go away until the monetary obligation is paid in full. So if this person owed $50,000 and they pay $49,999.99 to the association, that suspension is still not lifted even though they only owe a penny. So just keep in mind, this is while there is any monetary obligation remaining outstanding, that was the purpose or the reason that you suspended their use rights or voting rights. Okay, member meetings. This is the fun one. Uh, the annual meeting, basically gonna be for the purpose of the election. It's generally gonna be required in conjunction with or at the annual meeting. Uh, it's called, the bylaws are gonna say how that annual member meeting is called. If you don't have it in there, just look to the statute. The locations generally, location provided in the bylaws. It may be somewhere in the community. If your community doesn't have a location, it may be somewhere close to the community or it may be a general description. You'll have it within 45 miles of the community at a mutually convenient location. That might be in there and that's totally acceptable. Or it may say it's going to take place at the library on you know whatever road. Um, those are both absolutely fine. Special member meetings are a little bit different. They're going to basically say, hey, we're calling a meeting for a specific purpose and we want to discuss this issue, okay? We want to discuss and have the members vote on this particular issue. That's gonna happen when at least 10% of the, the owners, meaning your members, ask for a meeting in writing or the board decides to hold the special members meeting unless a different percentage is provided in the governing documents, okay? Um, the statutes are changing. Uh, it's actually the owner's obligation. This is a little bit different. As of October 1st, this is one of those statutory changes we mentioned before, okay? 
Normally right now, it's the owner, the association's obligation to maintain up-to-date mailing addresses for everyone for purposes of giving notices of meetings like this. Keep in mind on October 1st, it's going to change. So it's actually the owner's obligation, which I've always thought it should be, but it's the owner's obligation to say, hey, I'm leaving for a year. Please send my mail somewhere else instead of me complaining that I didn't get everything for a year because I never told you I wouldn't be here or I told you I would be gone, but I was in Zimbabwe for that year and didn't give any, anyone a mailing address. Okay, so this is actually a statutory change that's coming down the pike as of October 1st. Completely separate, somewhat related, because we're about to get into notices. Okay, the members are entitled to at least 14 days notice of every member meeting via mail hand delivery or electronic delivery. The person that's providing that notice should sign an affidavit and put it in the association's official records. Okay, we say here an agenda is not required to be provided for annual meetings, but do it anyway. You will be provide, you will be required to do that and have the agenda as of October 1st, as we mentioned earlier. Start doing it now if you can. And I'm glad to hear, not that I'm surprised, but that Empire is going through the process already of making sure that that's going on for all of these meetings for clients of theirs. Uh, I think that's been the right way to do it indefinitely from the beginning of time. But since the statutes didn't require it and a lot of bylaws don't require it, a lot of communities weren't doing it, I think it makes it easier. And frankly, when we get into speech at meetings, it makes it easier to limit how long it takes to get through that meeting, frankly. Um, proof of notice, we mentioned electronic notices. If the members individually, not just the members as a whole, but the individual members have agreed to accept notices from the association electronically, talking about fax, email, whatever you want to call it. Um, at that point, the association can send notices of any meeting or most meetings in that way. In other words, they can send just an email blast to all the members who've agreed to accept notices that way. And that's considered sufficient. You don't have to spend the, the dollar or whatever it ends up being to mail out a huge package of papers. Okay. Um, it doesn't have to be authorized in the bylaws to send this stuff via electronic mail instead of US mail. But electronic notice can't be used for recalls. Keep that in mind. We'll get into recalls later. Uh, membership meetings also need to be held at a location that's accessible to physically handicapped people if it's requested by a physically handicapped person who has a right to attend the meeting. That's part of why we say, even if you're holding your meetings via Zoom, it might be a good idea to have it accessible with one of the individuals that's on the board, one of the members of the community standing in a physical location where a computer or other device is available to have anyone who needs it and has requested it able to attend in person. Okay, a quorum, unless a lower number is provided in the bylaws, your quorum is 30%. Quorum is just the percentage of your members that needs to appear at that meeting, whether in person or by proxy, in order for you to actually hold a meeting. If you have less than that 30%, you can't have a meeting. And anything that gets voted on is worthless at that point during that meeting. Um, unless otherwise provided in the Florida statutes or in the governing documents, and there are specific sections that say you need a higher or lower vote than this, decisions made by the members are made by a majority of the voting interest represented at a meeting at which a quorum is present. In other words, you get your quorum and more than half the people that show up vote in favor of X in order for X to pass. Pretty straightforward. Okay, this is where we were talking earlier about you may want to restrict the right to speak at member meetings and at board meetings. Members have a right to speak for up to three minutes on every agenda topic. If you don't have an agenda, then anything the board brings up, those members are allowed to speak on. So have your agenda. You're limiting how long you can have all of your members speaking on each one of those topics. Okay, They can also speak to anything that's on the agenda or open for discussion, which is what I just said. The association can and should adopt reasonable rules governing the frequency, duration, and manner of member statements. In other words, my strong recommendation, every community association should have a member speech at meetings policy that is in writing and followed by the board. That's going to dictate that frequency, duration, and manner of member statements. It's going to say when the members get to talk, whether that's before or after the board discusses, before or after the board votes. Okay, um, a member has the right to record or videotape a meeting, period. They, you're, you're attending a corporate meeting, member has the right to record it. Um, again, member participation policy, that's a member speech at meetings policy 
put one in place. I hear a lot of communities, the boards, is, or, or frankly, even the managers telling me, well, we don't have problems with that. You know, everyone gets along pretty well in our community. That's great. I'm very happy for you. The second you have one person that's the, the troublemaker, that's when you'll wish you had this policy because you won't have the ability to put it in place if this person sits there and interrupts your ability to do business over the course of months, possibly I've, I've seen, and frankly, even working with a manager that is currently with Empire, I have seen someone interrupting every board meeting for a period of over a year. Okay, um, Empire wasn't representing the community, but it was a manager that's now with them and it, it went very poorly. And the association spent a lot of money instead of having this policy in place in advance. So spend the money up front to have the policy drafted, adopt it, and then you won't have to worry going forward. You just follow the policy. And if someone continues interrupting your meetings, that policy should also say you're allowed to call the police and have them removed as a trespasser and or a violator of your covenants um, treated as a nuisance, something of that nature. Moving on, voting by proxy, general proxies is basically you vote however you want at a specific meeting. Limited proxy is basically you can cast my vote in this particular manner on my behalf. I'm already, I'm voting. I'm not saying you vote for me. I'm saying I'm voting through you. Okay, both general and limited can be used to establish a quorum. Uh, the proxy is only good for the specific meeting it was originally given for and lawfully adjourned meeting. So if you can't reach that quorum requirement and you reset the meeting for 60 days out, you're okay. This next thing says if it's more than 90 days after the original date, you need a new proxy. Start over. Uh, every proxy is revocable until you show up at that meeting and enter the vote for that lot. Written consent in lieu of a meeting, this is one of those things that I mentioned is in the uh, not-for-profit statutes that a lot of attorneys don't know about. It can be used unless it's prohibited under the in the Articles of Incorporation. Um, it's basically you are having your members sign a piece of paper that says how they intend to vote instead of holding the actual meeting. You have basically 90 days to get all the votes together or hold the meeting. Okay, elections. We're gonna take a really long time on elections today. HOA elections are super difficult. Follow your bylaws. That's pretty much it. There, there's a lot of statutes that are on point, but honestly, it's that simple. Follow what's in your bylaws, follow what's in the statutes. If, if the statute says that it controls over the bylaws on any particular issue. Um, another thing I'll point out, it's, it's really that simple, but also when you are starting to count the uh, votes, make sure that you cut off the balloting so that you don't have people dropping off their ballots all night long and you can actually complete the meeting. That's another, just a pointer for purposes of these uh, meetings. Let's see, what else am I maybe missing? We're going to kind of blitz through this section. So I want to make sure that my notes are covered as well. Uh, let's see. Before you eliminate nominations at the meeting, make sure that documents don't allow for nominations from the floor. In other words, you know, you may have someone that's entering a nomination that's not someone that was on the list, so to speak. Um, make sure whether nominations from the floor are allowed or prohibited. And keep in mind also, if there are no nominations from the floor and you don't have enough people to have, you know, let's say you have five directors, five open slots for that election, and four people have put their names in the hat, and you don't have elections that are allowed to say, I'm showing up at the meeting and nominating someone from the floor during the election meeting. You've only got four people. You don't need an election. You just hold the meeting and announce who won. It's those four people that put their names in the hat if they're eligible to serve on the board, okay? So it, it really is that simple. Uh, we'll go through some of this stuff very briefly. Uh, if you don't have an election, it's not that the directors that are on come off and you have no board. You just roll over whoever was on the board, okay? Um, let's see. I think we're good there. You do need to provide 14 days notice before the election meeting unless your bylaws say otherwise. Okay, we've got the condo election deadlines in here in case your association, your bylaws follow that procedure. Most don't, some newer communities do because frankly, it makes more sense and it's easier. But if your governing documents don't require this, then it's literally show up, have an election, the end. Um, 
Elections are decided by plurality of ballots cast. In other words, whoever gets the most votes wins. A vacancy on the board that's caused by the expiration of a director's tomb is filled a term, not tomb. Good Lord, that would be dangerous. Uh, must be filled by electing a new board member. So in other words, if there's a vacancy, you will hold an election. If the vacancy is caused by resignation, you fill it by appointment or another election. Let's be honest, don't hold the election if you don't have to, just if, if the vacancy is caused by resignation. When I say vacancy, just for everyone's understanding, what I mean is you've got an open slot. So you've got five directors, someone either dropped off, resigned, frankly died, or just decided, you know what, I don't wanna run again. That can be filled by the election if you've got one coming up. Or let's say it's two months into the term and the person realized, I just don't have the time for this, or I'm tired of people attacking me for being one of multiple directors making these decisions on behalf of the association. I can't do this anymore. That's the one that you'll fill by appointment for sure. Uh, you can have an election by acclamation. That's basically where you don't need an election because you don't have enough people interested in serving on the board. Um, you just basically have those people step into the, the um, roles that they're appointed uh, at the election meeting, at the annual meeting. You need to keep records of the election for seven years, and any challenge to the election process needs to be commenced within 60 days after the results are announced. So keep in mind, any election question, in other words, I have a problem with the procedure that was followed in having the election, the notices, the counting of the ballots, etc., I wanted to be nominated from the floor, but I wasn't allowed, even though our bylaws allow it. Any of those types of issues need to be addressed by a lawsuit that's filed within 60 days after the election results are announced. Anytime after that, if the lawsuit's filed, the judge can kick it out of court. Let's see, I think we've covered that. Ballots aren't necessary unless there are two or more candidates that are eligible for a vacancy in any regular election. In other words, if there's an open slot and there's not two people searching to be put in that slot, you don't need ballots, you don't need an election. Okay, now we talked about election challenges. That's different from a recall, which we'll talk about later. I just want to be clear on that. Candidate is literally an eligible person who timely submitted any written notice of intent that's required under your bylaws. You might not have to give that written notice of intent. You might have just said, you know, I'm going to be, um, you know, if, if your governing documents allow for it, I'll, I'll announce my intent when we get to the meeting. That's fine. As long as candidates can say, I'm going to nominate myself from the floor, that's totally fine. Uh, the date that you determine eligibility, and we'll get into why this matters in a minute, is the last opportunity to declare your candidacy. That's going to be determined by your bylaws, like I mentioned. Okay. Uh, skip the condo part. That's not going to apply unless your, your community follows the condo statute. Okay. Anyone is eligible except these people. Someone convicted of a felony that was not released from prison for at least five years on the date that they seek election. Someone with pending charges of felony theft or embezzlement offenses in, involving association funds. Someone who's delinquent in payment of any fee, fine, or other monetary obligation to the association on that last day that they can be nominated. They can't even seek election. And then these are the, those are the three reasons you might not be allowed to serve. You may be kicked off or you are kicked off of the board. You are removed and not suspended, but you are off if you become more than 90 days uh, delinquent in the payment of any fee, fine, or monetary obligation while you're on the board. So if you don't pay your assessments for at least 90 days, you're technically off the board. Okay. So I, I like to get into examples. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time today. But the bottom line is, these are the three reasons you might not be eligible to even sit for nomination, let alone continue serving after the fact. Now, the good news is, again, for these things, it's no harm, no foul. Uh, if the association discovers this felony conviction and that it's been less than five years as of that date, if you know the, the pending charges involving another community are discovered, Nothing that that director has done, unless it was illegal in general, is going to be undone by virtue of the fact that they shouldn't have been on the board, shouldn't have been allowed to be on the ballot. Okay, so if you discover this later, you can remove the person from the board, but you're not necessarily going to undo anything they did unless it was something illegal. And there's more to it than just saying we're undoing this, we're voting against it. Most of the time, sometimes you can do it just that way. 
Okay, your director is at least three, unless your governing documents say otherwise. Your term expires at the end of the year. Staggered terms might apply. Staggered terms are basically you are on the board for two years so that someone with some experience remains on at all times. Term limits are you can only serve for a certain amount of time as a maximum. Those are going to be whatever the bylaws say they are. If they're not in there, there's no such limitations in an HOA. Uh, Co-owners can serve on the board together. There's no prohibition in an HOA. Okay, verifying the outer envelopes. This is largely a condo thing, but you're going to verify that everyone that voted is entitled to vote. And then you're going to go ahead and pull the, the ballot envelopes out of the outer you're going to separate those out, make sure, and this is the election process going through the counting. Um, you know what? I, I wanted to go through this, but honestly, if you're not in a condo, some of this just doesn't matter. The only thing I will mention is that if someone votes more than once that wasn't entitled to vote more than once or votes for too many people when you only had three open slots, they voted for five, those votes are marked disregarded and you literally write that word on the ballot or whatever document you have that was improper and they are left aside. Now keep in mind, all of these envelopes, all of these ballots, they still stay in the association's records even though they've been written on, okay? So those stay in the association's records. Uh, let's see, we addressed all that. The officers, basically the bylaws should say what the, who the officers are, but if not, you have a president, secretary, and treasurer. President usually can't be the same person as the secretary. Um, the other positions, it can be whoever. Some communities don't even require that you be a member of the community to be an officer. So keep in mind, I've seen some communities bringing in outside officers that aren't compensated, but they serve anyway for some reason that I can't understand. Um, officers serve without compensation unless the bylaws say otherwise. And at the pleasure of the board, what that means, the pleasure of the board, just like all committees, the board has the right to vote out an officer. So let's talk about the three hats you might be wearing as a member of your board of directors. One is a member. These are literally the people that own a property in your community. One is a director. Your board of directors is a group of directors, a group of individuals who make the motions on behalf of the board, second those motions, and vote on them and discuss them. That's literally all your board is supposed to be doing. And your officers are the ones that are going to prepare the meeting minutes, sign the documents, sign the, the um, you know, your president's usually going to be the one that signs contracts. And you might also have a manager that's contracted to do a lot of the, the tasks that your treasurer, secretary, possibly even your president were otherwise doing. Okay, that's why a lot of people hire a manager, because they can do it a lot better because they've got a lot more experience um, for the most part. You know, I, I haven't seen any problems with Empire. I haven't seen any problems with most management firms, but there are a few individual managers here and there who profess to have a lot of knowledge that they should be passing along questions to attorneys and choose not to do that to try and save the association money and end up costing the association a lot more in the end. So be cognizant of your manager's level of knowledge. If you're with Empire, you're safe. Uh, I won't name any others today because we thank Empire for having us on, but the bottom line is there are many capable managers out there, work with one of them, and I promise you the cost is going to pay for itself in your, your director's time, effort, and in the mistakes that won't happen because you had someone capable in there. Um, so moving back to the officers, the directors can't vote by proxy or secret ballot at board meetings, except that if you're electing the officers, you can do it that way. Um, another thing about communication and voting by directors, the directors can communicate by email. They can't vote by email. They can vote by written uh, instrument that is unanimous and signed by all of the directors that replaces a board meeting. That is one thing that a lot of communities don't realize they can do. Again, that's under the not-for-profit act, just like the one that I mentioned earlier, the written consent form. Uh, there's no prohibition against changing officers midstream, meaning mid-year. Electronic voting is fantastic. Use a vendor, have them basically take care of everything for you, and you'll be able to have your votes on your cell phone. It is amazing if you're able to get it accomplished, if it's worth it for your community because your people are tech savvy enough to get on a cell phone, click through an app. Um, it'll save you money in the long run. It'll save you time in the long run. Uh, we do work with a couple vendors in particular. I'm not going to mention them here because 
frankly. That's not what we're here for, but you're welcome to reach out. Any, any issues that are general questions, please, I'll give you my email at the end of this presentation. You're welcome to reach out to me directly. Okay, electronic voting, we're going to skip the rest. The Board of Directors. Now, we mentioned the different hats that the directors wear. I want to fully clarify the directors and the officers are the only ones, not the members, but the directors and officers, each owe a fiduciary responsibility to the association. That's basically saying you are a trustee of the association. There isn't a higher duty under Florida law. You're held to a really important standard. The good news is that the standard you're held to is the highest duty, but gauged by the dumbest person in the room standard. Okay, it's did you reasonably think if if someone were to come after you as a director or an officer for something you did, it's did you reasonably think that what you did was in the best interest of the association as a whole? That's called the business judgment rule, and it protects directors and officers most of the time unless they are grossly negligent or intentionally did something malicious to somebody else. Okay, so if you sent an email saying, well, she pissed me off when she was on the board, so I'm going after her now, that might not be protected speech. You might not be using your best business judgment. So if you make business decisions rather than emotional decisions, and you can express that you're making a business decision, especially when you say, I don't like this, but I think it's best for the association, when you're in your meetings, fantastic, okay? What you're proving is that you're doing what's in the association's best interest, not just your own best interest, okay? Um, directors and officers have a couple really important bills. The third most important bill you'll ever see is your directors and officers liability insurance policy bill, okay? The most important is gonna be your lawyer, second most is gonna be your manager, then it's this, because these are the people that are protecting you and making sure that frankly, you don't screw up. And if you do, you don't get in trouble for it, okay? We're, these are the three groups of people that are gonna protect your association and your directors the most out of anyone. And when I say this, I normally say it as a joke, but the reality is those are your three most important bills that you're gonna see throughout the course of the year. Okay, so moving on, we, just, we talked about fiduciary duty. We talked about business judgment rule. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is if we didn't use such a low standard of good faith belief that the actions were in the association's best interest, chances are no one would want to serve on a board. So this is why we judge by such a low standard. Uh, there is no compensation allowed for directors or officers unless the bylaws say you have some kind of compensation and except for the following. So you're participating in a financial benefit accruing to all or a significant number of members. In other words, it's not just you're benefiting from it, it's everyone benefits from it. You're still allowed to be a member of the community and benefit from that. Reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses, it's not a benefit, it's just something being covered, okay? Now that should not be your cell phone bill. It should be you went out and spent money on a party that the association is throwing you're getting the money back for the cups and plates that you shouldn't have had to spend the money on because it's not your party, it's the association's party. Okay, recovery of insurance proceeds that everyone gets or your unit gets or your lot gets because your lot was the one that was damaged. Any fee or compensation authorized in the governing documents, that's what I mentioned earlier, or by a voting majority of the voting interest, voting in person or by proxy to a meeting of the members, and then a developer or a representative serving as a director, officer, or committee member of the association can also be compensated. Uh, another preview of the statutes coming into place, that director or that director who is serving on behalf of the developer is probably going to have to go ahead and report that benefit and that service once a year, basically announcing at an open meeting, hey, I, I was appointed by the direct uh, the developer and you know my interest might be impacted by that and the way that I vote might be impacted by that. It's not that specific statement, but that general concept of I was appointed by the developer needs to be stated out loud once a year. Okay, unless otherwise provided, the corporation basically operates through the board. Okay, so this is why when you have individual directors, individual officers that just decide to go rogue and send out violation notices, sign contracts on behalf of the association, direct um, vendors that they have no right to direct, that's why they should be getting in trouble for doing it. 
because it's not something that they have the authority to do unless they were delegated that right by the board as a whole. No director, even the president, should be making unilateral decisions unless that power has been delegated or in the event of an emergency. Okay, the board's generally responsible for maintaining the association property. In other words, the health, safety, and welfare powers of the association are done by the board. When does a board meeting actually happen? Just keep in mind, board meetings have to be open and noticed to the members unless they're um, closed off because it's an attorney-client privilege discussion regarding existing or future li uh, litigation or it's the potential hiring or compensation of one of your employees. That could be your manager. It could be your maintenance person. By the way, that, that final result still needs to go in the meeting minutes. It's not that you can close off the result. You can just close off the discussion. So a board meeting is a board meeting when a quorum of members meets and discusses association business. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what the context is. If you're sitting at the bar or on the golf course with three out of five directors and you start talking about association business, technically that could be considered a board meeting. Okay, if you've got even a five member board and three of those are out, that's a quorum. So you wanna make sure that you're not having all of your members technically have the right. Remember we talked about member speech at meetings. They have the right to speak for three minutes. Every member has the right to speak for three minutes on every topic that you start to discuss at that meeting. So technically, when you're on the fourth hole, all of your members can walk up to you while you're trying to swing and talk to your buddy who happens to be on the board with you and kind of sit there and interrupt you for three minutes each. Okay, we don't want that. So make sure if you're discussing association business, as soon as you start that discussion, cut it off, stop, schedule a meeting, or send an email and have the discussion that way in the right manner, okay? Uh, the same applies to committees of the association. If that meeting includes a vote on whether to spend association funds or any architectural review body is meeting to decide whether to approve or reject any architectural applications. So that openness requirement and what is a meeting will apply to those two types of committees as well. Okay, practical tips. Um, you can ratify things that happen outside a proper board meeting. In other words, well, we didn't have time to sit and meet, but we all know how we would have voted because we emailed back and forth. You still need to hold the discussion at that next board meeting. You still need to vote at that next board meeting. You still need to give the members an opportunity to vote at that next board meeting. But you can ratify the decision that's already been made by virtue of someone who's already signed a contract, taken action, et cetera. Um, keep in mind, anyone that's on the board or is an officer has apparent authority to act on behalf of the association. So we have seen people, and I'm seeing it now in one of the communities that we represent, people are just going out and saying, oh yeah, I'm doing this on behalf of the association without any director saying it's okay. Well, avoid that. Tell all your vendors, listen, the only person you're authorized to speak with regarding this contract is this person. Or if you find that that vendor is negotiating with an individual that doesn't have the right to negotiate or sign a contract, send that vendor a message saying, hey, I'm speaking to you on behalf of the actual board and we haven't authorized this person to contract. So if they sign a contract, it's not going to be binding on our association. Okay. Make sure, by the way, that you curtail that behavior with a cease and desist letter and potentially getting an injunction to stop that bad behavior because it can cause problems. Um, again, directors can use emails to discuss, just not vote. Oh, one uh, general recommendation, have a separate email address for use of just, just for your association, if you're a director, so that you're not getting 8 million emails to your personal email. And then if the association gets sued or you get sued for something that has to do with the association, you then have to look through your personal emails. It also makes it easier for continuity to just hand that email password over to the next person that takes your position. So what I recommend is, you know, directors as a general email address and or president at whatever community or president HOA, um, you know, president empire at gmail.com. It doesn't have to be paid. It just has to be secure. Okay. So just that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, to make sure that you don't have to then go sift through your personal emails when the discovery process starts or someone sends a records inspection request to the association. Okay, that's just a free tidbit there. Speaking of tidbits, there is no free lunch for a director. 
Uh, if the board finds that an officer or director has violated the subsection that we're talking about here, which is to solicit, offer to accept, or accept any good or service for value that they didn't pay for, for their own benefit, or for their immediate family's benefit from anyone that is proposing to contract with the association, they can be removed from office. The vacancy gets filled in accordance to the law until the end of the director's term. So in other words, you mess around, you will find out. Uh, an officer, director, or manager can accept food to be consumed at a business meeting with a value of less than $25 per individual or a service or good received in connection with trade fairs or education programs. So if you were at the HOA and Condo Expo in Orlando or Tampa a couple months ago, uh, you might have met with us in person and we might have handed you a stress ball or a pad of paper or a pen with our firm name on it. Those things are all okay because they're in connection with a trade fair. If I was to give you something for free because we were doing this seminar in person, we were to offer food, drink, whatever, that would be acceptable as well because it's in conjunction with an education program. If it's not in conjunction with one of those two, keep in mind, you are doing something that is against the law. Okay, you're guilty until proven innocent if charged by information or indictment. In other words, in a criminal context with a felony theft or embezzlement offense involving association funds. Okay or property, that person's removed from office, automatic until they are done. Okay, if, if, they're, if the finding is they weren't guilty or they accept a plea or of guilty or no loan contendere, uh, the director is reinstated. Okay, in other words, you're guilty if you've been charged in this HOA context. Okay, the fact that those charges are pending, we discussed earlier, you can't be appointed or elected to a position or as a director or officer. If you've got these embezzlement charges involving funds or property of an association. Okay, board meetings, as compared to all the other meetings we mentioned before, they're usually 14 days notice. This is only 48 hours posted notice, cons posted conspicuously on the property in a specific location designated by the board. What that means is you literally take your notice, it's a piece of paper, your agenda goes behind it or in front of it, I don't care. You stick it to a poster board, you're done. If you don't have any of that, I actually have seen in smaller communities or even in bigger ones, if you've got a front entrance, stick a sign on a, a uh, paint stick and put a piece of cardboard that won't hopefully fly away with black magic marker, writing down the date, time, location of the meeting, staple your agenda to that. And anyone that comes in, hopefully you're putting it in a safe location so they're not stopping their vehicles in the way of traffic, but that's generally it. Uh, if you are going to consider non-emergency special assessments, notice the non-emergency part, or an amendment to the rules regarding parcel use or unit use, you need a 14-day written notice. It needs to be mailed, delivered, or electronically transmitted. Remember, we talked about emails, if accepted by the individual, to all owners and posted conspicuously for 14 days in advance of the meeting. Okay, Evidence of this notice needs to be uh, included. It doesn't necessarily require an affidavit, but that is the better way to do it. An affidavit is basically written testimony. You're testifying to the fact that you've done X, Y, Z, or that this is accurate. Okay. So this is the equivalent of written testimony that we can present in court as evidence if it's drafted pr properly. Uh, you're, you don't need an agenda, but do it anyway. You will need it as of October 1st. That's one of the things that we were saying is changing. Uh, notice of any board meeting when assessments are going to be considered, you need to include in the notice that assessments are going to be considered and the nature of the assessment. If that's your budget meeting, you literally just say the annual budget and maybe provide a copy of the budget. We'll get into that later. Uh, if 20% of the voting interest petition the board to address an item of business, this is when the board needs to hold a board meeting, a special board meeting, within 60 days after receipt of the, the petition. Okay, It's the next board meeting or at a special board meeting called for that purpose. If you don't hold regular meetings or your meetings are every 90 days, you might need to call a special meeting for that purpose. Otherwise, it just goes on the agenda for the next meeting, whatever that item is that the members wanted you to address. Okay, members have the right to attend and speak at meetings of the board. Keep that in mind. Set your policy. We discussed it earlier. I'm going to say it again now. Have a written policy that governs how members are allowed to speak and attend meetings. Um, so let's see. We discussed all this. All the rights pertaining to member uh, meetings are going to pertain to board meetings as well as really what this says. 
Uh, majority of the board is a quorum. So whenever you have a majority of the board, not only do you have a board meeting, but you have reached a quorum of directors for purposes of a board meeting. Um, you can meet by phone, you can meet by Zoom, nothing wrong with that. As long as, like I said, if someone requests the ability to attend in person due to a handicap or a disability, you need to give them the ability to do that. Uh, you can use a speaker phone uh, for purposes of ensuring that the, the discussion that's going on can actually be heard by everyone in the room if someone is attending by phone. The, let's see, uh, yeah, we kind of addressed all that, so let's move on. Uh, what do a golem and a board workshop have in common? They're both mythical. There is no such thing as a workshop. There is no such thing as a town hall meeting. It's something that we do as a courtesy to the members and to try and gauge where we're at and what we want to do. But a workshop is not a useful tool to get around board meetings or committee meetings. If you are making decisions, you are having a board meeting. Uh, we discussed the final decisions and ARC, so we'll skip through that. Contracts between the association and a director. This is where we get into conflicts, okay? conflicts of interest. If the association is entering into a contract or other transaction with one of its directors or a corporation or other entity where the director is also involved directly, um, the board must comply with the following requirements. And by the way, we have an entire class on conflicts of interest that you're welcome to check out. I don't get anything out of it. It's free. It's on our website. You're welcome to just check that out to get into more detail about some of these conflict issues. Uh, but if there is a conflict, conflict, I need some water. Um, the conflict needs to be fully disclosed to the board and the disclosure needs to be put in the board minutes and the contract needs to be voted into approval by two thirds of the directors present at that meeting, not including the individual who must, who has a conflict and as a result needs to step aside and walk out of the room or shut down the Zoom while the discussion of that is being done. And while the members are, act, or the, the directors are actually voting uh, whether or not to approve that contract. Contract, And the reason for that is you don't want undue influence. You don't want that director who already has a conflict to say, you're going to sign this, right? You just don't want it to happen. So it's basically a way of avoiding that undue influence, not having that person in the room. They can present the contract as an option, just like any other vendor. They can present it even as a director. They just can't attend that discussion by the board and they can't vote. That is the only reason a director is allowed to abstain. Abstention is not, I don't like what the board is doing. It's not, I don't like the two options that I'm being presented, so I'm just not going to vote. If you don't vote, and it's for another reason, you're treated as not attending that meeting, or at least that portion of the meeting. And if your bylaws say that the directors can remove anyone who doesn't show up for a certain amount of meetings, keep in mind you're putting your, your directorship at risk. Either way, it's a bad idea to say, I don't like what you're doing, so I'm not going to vote. If you don't like it, vote against it. Simple. Um, that is literally your only job as a director is to discuss and vote. So if you're refusing to do that, you're refusing to do your entire job as a director. Keep that in mind. Um, and then so getting back to these conflicts at the next regular or special member meeting, that conflict also needs to be disclosed. And regardless of how deep into that contract you may be, you could be six months in and have performed for six months under that contract. But if the members move at that next meeting to cancel that contract, it can be canceled by majority vote of the members present at the meeting. Meaning if you have a quorum at a member meeting and the members, now this has to be the next one after the contract is signed, but the next member meeting, if you have a quorum and a majority of the people that actually show up at that meeting where there is a quorum, vote to terminate the contract, it gets terminated. If that happens, the association is only liable for the reasonable value of the goods and services provided up to the time of cancellation, not any termination fees, liquidated damages, or other penalties that are included in the contract for termination. So for example, I'm in the process of negotiating a contract right now. It basically says you have to pay X hundred thousand dollars if you terminate this contract in year one. If that was terminated by the members in this manner, because of a conflict at the next meeting of the members, members wouldn't have to pay a penny towards that termination fee. It would just be the reasonable cost of what the vendor has provided by way of uh, services and goods. 
All right, how to get off, you resign in writing, which is effective either on the date that it says in the resignation, or if it doesn't contain a date, it's effective upon delivery. Uh, a recall is another way, we'll get into that later. Delinquent in the payment for 90 days or more, or more than 90 days, we discussed that. Criminal charges involving theft or embezzlement of association funds or property, we discussed. And failure to satisfy the uh, certification requirement today. Receipt of an excessive gift, that $25 rule we talked about and death is number seven. Budgets, reserves, and financial reporting. Bottom line, your budget needs to be your best guess of what you think your community is gonna spend over the next year. That means you need to increase the budget by a million dollars compared to last year. That's what the board needs to do. Keep in mind, you may have limitations in your, in your bylaws that say, if it's gonna increase by more than 5%, you can't do it. What it's really gonna say, everyone thinks it says you can't do it. What it's really gonna say is, the members can propose an alternative budget. I've never seen the members propose an alternative budget. So chances are, if you put a budget out there, you've done your fiduciary duty, you've complied with your obligations as a director, and you're doing it the right way. You're not backing into a figure and not spending money you need to spend because your budget was too low. You're not under budgeting so that the association, you know, the, the uh, membership thinks you're doing a great job because you're not raising the assessments, but by the way, you're also not maintaining the community. Um, you're doing what you reasonably believe is going to be required to maintain and operate the community up to the standard that's set forth in the declaration and frankly, that your members should be expecting. Okay, it's, it's not the standard of what's cheapest. It's not the standard of what's easiest. It's the standard of this community, period. Not this community as it's been for the last five years when the board didn't do what they were supposed to. Currently, what do you need? Okay, if you're doing anything other than that, my opinion is you're not complying with your responsibilities. Let the members decide they want an alternative budget. That's totally fine. Even give them the idea to propose, propose an alternative budget. But I want to protect the directors. I want to protect the officers. And so to everyone that's on this call, I want to say, make sure that the budget that is proposed by the board will cover all those expenses, even if the members eventually decide an alternative budget is better because it would cost them less money. That way you've done what you need to do. Let them make the decision. You don't get to unilaterally decide we're gonna make it artificially low and frankly screw everyone because we can't maintain the property to the extent that we should. Okay, that's pretty much all I have about budgets. Um, we're gonna go through a little bit more. The budget needs to include anything you're planning on spending in a line item format, anything you plan on bringing in throughout the course of the year. That could be selling t-shirts with your association logo. It could be whatever it may be, it, your assessments. If you plan to find a bunch of people, I don't care what the income is, that goes into your budget if it's something that's planned for. Uh, the members get to, the, the board generally gets to adopt the budget. The board generally gets to present a budget. The members can say, we don't like it. Then they get to decide, we're going to use an alternative one. But that alternative only comes into play if the members actually say, we don't like this one and vote in a different budget. Okay, moving along, um, you can't, you have to have the notice, the 14 day notice of an assessment being considered. That includes the budget meeting, in my opinion. And so, although the, the 48 hours is generally required, my suggestion provide 14 days notice before any budget meeting because you are considering assessments, that's where assessments come from. By the way, if you didn't understand that, here's an important point. When you are telling people, these are the maintenance assessments you have to pay every month, quarter, semi-annual, year, whatever it may be, this is where they come from, is your budget. So what I'm saying is if you don't budget enough in your assessments or budget enough in your budget, if you're saying we're gonna underfund the budget, then you're guaranteeing that you won't have the money to do what you need to do throughout the year. And again, I know that might make you look bad. You might be making the former directors look bad and saying, well, you know, they thought this was enough. We think we need to do this in order to maintain the community to the standard that it's supposed to be maintained at. Reserves, if you don't have a reserve in your declaration, it wasn't established by the developer and it wasn't established by your members, you don't have to have one in an HOA. Reserves are basically funds set aside for big assets being repaired or maintained or replaced in your community. Some communities will say, I don't have to have a reserve, but anything that's gonna cost more than 10 grand for uh, replacement or repairs, we're gonna have to set aside some money for that. That is a reserve, it's just not called one. 
Okay, so there are different terms. You guys can review this later, but because reserves aren't required in an HOA unless they've been established, I don't think it's worth spending a bunch of time going through this. You're welcome to reach out to me directly if your community has reserves and you want to say, well, yeah, you told me this didn't matter, but now it does. So what do we do? Okay, they can be created by the membership, as I mentioned, computing them. You're basically taking the estimated useful life of whatever the asset is that you're saving money for and dividing it by how long you expect it to, uh, I'm sorry, dividing it by the amount of money that it's going to cost to do the repairs or replacement that's needed. So really easy, straight line formula explanation. If it costs 10 grand to re-roof your clubhouse and the roof has a life expectancy of 10 years, you're saving 10 grand a year to have that money by year 10 when you expect that asset to need replacement or repairs. The other thing you want to do is have reserve studies done in the interim or at least increase that reserve to account for inflation because let's be realistic 10 years from now it's not going to cost 100 grand that was the estimate you got in year 1 it's going to cost more most likely so you want to account for inflation or have an actual reserve study done every so often even if you're not maintaining reserves just to see what money you might need for any of these assets that you might need to repair or replace you can waive or reduce those reserves if they're established. It's basically a majority of a quorum of the owners needs to vote in favor of waiving them. In other words, not having them in your budget or reducing them. In other words, having less than what should have been in your budget because you don't need to save the money or you don't want to save the money. Uh, if those reserve accounts are established, they can be terminated by a majority of the total voting interests. Now, when I say total voting interests, I don't mean a majority of a quorum. I mean a majority of every person in your community or every lot owner within your community. So keep that in mind. You can terminate those reserves and not have to save that money anymore if the if a majority of your entire community wants to do that and actually takes the time to vote. That's where electronic voting really comes into play. You can only use the reserves for that purpose most of the time. Um, there are instances where you can use it for another purpose. If you have a pooled reserve, and that's for straight line accounting. If you have a pooled reserve, meaning you're just saving up money and you use it for the next thing within that pool of assets that is going to fail, it's gonna need some maintenance, it's gonna need some replacement. Um, you can use it for whatever comes up next. And then you just recalculate what needs to be in that pool based on the fact that you've now incurred that expense, you've used up the funds and you need to save for the next time that that thing is going to fail. Financial reports, within 90 days after the end of the fiscal year, the association needs to prepare and complete or contract with a third party, which is usually your accountant or your CPA, for the preparation and completion of a financial report for the preceding fiscal year. Um, the members are entitled to a copy within 21 days after that report is completed okay, or received from that third party. Can't be more than 120 days after the end of the fiscal year. So your, your accountant, you're sending it 90 days in. They only have 30 days to get that done and you send it out to your members. Um, and then a written, the alternative to providing that copy is just like with your budget, you can provide a written notice that a copy is available upon request and no charge to the member. The levels of financial reporting, there are multiple different levels depending on what income your community is generating. Um, I, the bottom line is more money you have, more mo money, more problems is really it. You know, you, you have 150 to 300,000, you need a compiled financial statement. If you're less than 150, it's literally your ledger. Uh, if it's 300 to 500,000, you need reviewed financial statements, which include a little bit of scrutiny, but don't necessarily require a CPA. And then the big mamma jamma, the uh, 500,000 or more in annual revenues, you actually need um, an audited financial statement. And that's literally what you think it is. It's an audit of every piece of paper in the association's records. So you can vote to reduce these requirements increase these requirements. In other words, go down or up a level. If your members think it's appropriate, that's another majority of the membership uh, vote in order to approve that reduction or increase in what your scrutiny level is going to be in reviewing your financials. Okay, a uh, few things every board member should know how to do. Just read through these when you have time. We're not going to go through them right now just because of time constraints, but these are important things. We'll talk about meeting minutes now. It's basically all of your board meetings and member meetings should have meeting minutes. 
They don't need to be verbatim records of everything that was discussed during that meeting. It's literally, here's what was voted on. Here's how each person voted. That's it. What was the motion? Who made it? Who seconded it? Who voted on it? Done. Okay. It's that simple. And that's the same thing when you have these closed attorney client privileged meetings with your attorney. Now, if you're going to close the meeting because it's attorney client privileged, by the way, I didn't mention earlier, you got to have an attorney present. You can't just have a closed executive session. That's another meaningless term. Okay? You have to have an attorney present. Your attorney doesn't need to be giving detailed guidance every second of, of that meeting. So frankly, sometimes I will sit in on those meetings and I will give guidance occasionally and I might frankly, be working on something else. So I don't have to charge the association for that full, let's say it's an hour long meeting. I might charge a half hour because that's the time that I was directly giving guidance versus listening to the board, thinking through and discussing what they want to do with that privileged issue. That's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it's the way that I've found that saves associations some money without losing the ability to have those closed meetings and without losing any of the input that they want from me. Um, minutes of all meetings, including again, those privileged meetings, those employee meetings, they all go in the association's records. Um, they need to be placed in the association's records within a reasonable time. There's no legal definition, statutory definition of a reasonable time that I'm aware of. Okay. Presumably six months is not a reasonable time. That's too long. But if it takes three weeks or until the next meeting, when those minutes are approved, which is how a lot of people do it, I don't have a problem with that unless your meetings are held quarterly. At that point, you may want to get them approved or at least a draft, which I don't like drafts going into the association records either because they're not final minutes, but get something in there. Um, and, and even if you have to email around and have everyone say, yes, this is what we will approve and ratify at the next board meeting, that's fine. Again, abstention is recorded as well. It's not just voted in favor, voted against, didn't vote. It's abstain from voting if that individual specifically said, I'm abstaining. Okay, the governing documents may grant access to a lot. That could be for emergencies. It could be for the purposes of self-help, which is going onto the lot and performing whatever the association was, or the owner was supposed to do. In other words, mowing their lawn, repainting their house. Some of those things I think are a little bit unreasonable to enter onto someone's property to do, but you might have the right to do it if, if there's an across the board right of the association to maintain the lot if the owner fails to do so. Keep in mind, you might have the obligation to do so before you file a lawsuit for injunctive, un, injunctive relief, or at least threaten to do that self-help before you file that lawsuit. Uh, the Marketable Record Title Act basically says if you don't preserve covenants within the first 30 years after what's called the root of title, which is basically the first transfer to each lot owner from the developer in, in our instance. Most of the time to make it easier for analysis purposes, we actually just look at the date of recording the declaration and go 30 years out. But if you don't do this preservation in the right amount of time, which is 30 years from a specific date on a lot by lot basis, those covenants expire as to each one of those lots. So there are a lot of exceptions to the general rule, but bottom line, association covenants are subject to MARTA which is the Market of Worker Title Act. What we wanna do is record a preservation document that avoids that the association basically is still required to do everything it was required to do before. You keep all the obligations, you still have to maintain the community, you still have to operate the community, you still have to have elections, you still have to pay your vendors. The problem is you no longer have the ability to enforce any of your covenants. People can do whatever the heck they want on their property, people can, not pay their assessments and you can't for you can't pursue any of those violations because the covenants are no longer valid they don't encumber that property anymore speaking of uh violations another one of the changes that's coming up and i'm going to try and go through some of these now because i know that we're going to run short on time the um legislature in its infinite wisdom decided that associations shouldn't be able to prohibit people from doing what they want in their backyards or anywhere else on the property that it's not visible from the street or any other lots. That includes parking boats, RVs, regardless of what's in your covenants, those may no longer be enforceable. Um, I think there's an argument that that is an unconstitutional restraint on the association's covenants. I don't know that any of my clients want to be the test subject for that and take it up to the Supreme Court of Florida to make a determination of whether that statute should apply after spending 
100, $150,000 in legal fees. So bottom line, be prepared. That goes into effect July 1st. Um, I don't understand it. I think it's absurd, but here we are. Welcome to Florida. Um, you know, there's a reason that there is a Florida man and a Florida woman. Uh, and this is just one of them. It's just allowing things like that to happen. But back to MARTA, um, you can use preservation. It's actually really easy. The board approves that your attorney prepares a document that refers back to all of the recorded covenants you want to keep in place. Usually that's your declaration and amendments. It's pretty straightforward. Might be bylaws, articles of incorporation if those are recorded just to be safe. And then you record this one to two page document that is approved by the board and signed by the board and you pre you're preserved for another 30 years. Okay, if you don't do that preservation, this is where people get in trouble, you need to go through a revitalization process. And what that essentially means is you need to go through the process of having at least a little more than half of your membership approve revitalizing, reinstituting those covenants to make them kick back into being able to control what's going on in your community. Keep in mind, anything that happened during that expiration period until the revitalization, you can't enforce. So the assessments that came due until that document gets recorded, the revitalization gets recorded, and the DEO, which is a government organization, actually approves it, you're not going to be able to enforce anything. And any covenant violations, someone painted their house polka dots, not going to be able to enforce anything about that. So don't let your covenants expire. I'm dealing with two communities right now who need to revitalize their covenants. They came to us thinking we were going to do a whole bunch of enforcement and a whole bunch of collection. And my response was, I'm really sorry, but someone screwed up here. Now, one of the ways that people have screwed up and that we are trying to correct is in 2018, this MARTA statute was changed with respect to community associations in Florida. And it was changed to say, if you have an amendment, one of the ways you can preserve is via an amendment to your governing documents that refers back to those previous covenants. But because that right didn't exist until that statute was put in place in 2018, if you recorded an amendment before 2018, my opinion and several other attorneys' opinion within the firm and outside of our firm who I've consulted with, who are experts in MARTA, have basically said, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think your covenants were preserved. So you want to make sure to get with your attorney. The, the thing that your attorney should be doing the second that they take over your community is pulling a copy of your governing documents, making sure that they know what that MARTA date looks like and that they are calendaring to let you know about five years in advance. Hey, you got to discuss this and here's why. Okay. In addition to wanting to preserve your covenants at the first board meeting, excluding the organizational meeting, that organizational meeting is where you elect your officers. Okay. At the first meeting after that, after the annual meeting every year, you need to discuss MARTA and make sure that you're preserving if you need to. This is really crucial. It's very complicated and at the same time, very simple. Don't let that 30 years pass without recording a preservation instrument because you're going to get yourself into a much more costly endeavor trying to revitalize. And frankly, it's going to take a lot more work on your part and on the part of your attorney than preparing that two-page document based on a title search report. Process servers, let them in. This is people that are coming to your community trying to literally deliver court documents to someone so that they are deemed served with process. You got to let them in your community, whether it's gated or not. If the person that they're trying to serve is known to be in the community. If you have no idea who the person is, you might not need to let this person in. Rules and regulations, we discussed uh, the rule can be passed. You need to provide 14 days notice to the members because it's a change in the use rights and restrictions. Um, basically, the board is allowed to adopt rules and regulations that say within the strictures of here's what's in your declaration, these use restrictions, as long as it's generally restricted in the declaration or you have a general right to create any rules and regulations and it doesn't conflict with what's in the declaration, you're allowed to create these rules. And it basically says you can or can't do X. That's as, that's as simple as it gets, okay? Most recently, the one that I created just a week or two ago was because as of July 1st, there will be a, a lack of requirement for a concealed carry permit to carry a concealed firearm in Florida. Uh, we wanted to make sure, or my community board wanted to make sure that we put in place a restriction saying, you cannot carry a concealed firearm regardless of what other rights you may have on the community at the community pool or in the community's clubhouse or in the community's playgrounds, et cetera, places where we're frankly trying to protect children, okay? 
you can get into the pol politics. You know, I, I'm not going to get into that right now of whether children are more or less protected by not allowing firearms in those areas. But the bottom line is some of your communities might want this to be put in place, or you might want completely different laws or, or regulations uh, put in place to frankly keep everyone safe and maintain your community the way you want it. So these are rules and restrictions the board gets to put in place. Still at an open board meeting, still noticed 14 days in advance, but it gets put in place. And generally speaking, my suggestion is get these recorded so that anyone that is potentially buying or renting in your community is deemed on notice of everything in those rules and regulations and have it all in one set of rules and regulations as well, not just a haphazard, oh, here's our rules regarding X. Okay, put them in one document and put the date that they were last amended in that title of the document and get it recorded every time. Material alterations, um, if someone changes in a perceptive way, the form, shape, elements, or specifications of a building or anything on the exterior of a building, you're basically changing the appearance of something. Um, that's what a material alteration is, okay? So you're basically sitting here changing the way th something looks. Um, there's some examples here. The statute doesn't require approval on material alterations to common areas, facilities, or association property. A lot of governing documents will, however, require a member vote if you have a certain dollar amount that's being spent by the association to make those changes. So you might need to get your members to vote anyway. One exception to that, which we mentioned here, if the purpose of the change is, yes, you're changing the appearance, but really what you're trying to do is protect the common elements or the association property. So Tiffany Plaza is the name of a case where a rock revetment wall was being installed. That's basically where you have a waterway and you have an entire wall that's built up adjacent to the, the roadway that's right next to it or the sidewalk that's right next to that waterway. Okay, That's going to protect these rocks that are going around the, the edge of that waterway are going to protect your community. Well, if it's for protection, for health, safety, and welfare purposes, you probably don't need a member vote, even if you are making one of these material alterations. Architectural standards, you need to have those in writing. They might be in the declaration. They're basically rules and regulations when it comes to their priority, but you have to have them in writing and they have to be fairly clear to be enforceable. So anything that's not clearly stated in your governing documents as a restriction as to the location, type, or appearance of any improvement or any standards, um, it needs to be specifically stated or reasonably inferred what the members are allowed and not allowed to do within those specific, uh, I'm sorry, those specific criteria. So you need to have a written set of criteria and it needs to be pretty clear. We used to say, or I used to say you want it to be pretty vague so that you can control as much as possible. The statute was changed a couple of years ago to specify it needs to be clear now or it's not enforceable at all. Okay, so if you have the declaration saying, you know, you've got these general prohibitions, these general restrictions, I still recommend having a set of rules and regulations and a set of architectural standards. If you have an architectural review process, make sure that that's a meaningful process, not just, well, look at the declaration, see if it's allowed or not, and that's the end of it. Um, what's not mentioned here, there are some federal laws that are going to prohibit you from restricting certain things. So the over the air, um, device rule basically says that you can control the location of an over-the-air device, meaning a satellite dish or something like that, but it can't be required to be placed in a location that is going to make it less useful. In other words, the service is going to be poor. Um, you also can't require that the application be submitted before it's placed. You can They, they can do it after the fact. Uh, you're about to lose even more control over that if it is hidden by bushes or something like that with this change that's coming down the pike, like I mentioned earlier in July. Uh, you can limit the location, but you can't prohibit solar panels, clotheslines, and a few other items. So beware before you try and enforce against those. The, there is a statute, I think it's chapter 163 or 136, I candidly don't remember, uh, but it's basically the um, solar power statute where we want to be more um, solar friendly and, and less energy um, vampires, I guess we could say. Um, and then there's Florida friendly landscaping statutes, which are 
more difficult to understand than most of these other ones. So just keep in mind, you can have your restrictions, but make sure your attorney looks at them to say whether they're enforceable or not so that you don't get yourself in trouble for rejecting something or telling someone something's a violation that you're required to allow. Emergency powers I won't go through other than to mention the fact that if there is a state of emergency declared in the city, county, state, or national, uh, that includes COVID, things of that nature, hurricanes, things of that nature. There are emergency powers that kick in. I feel like it might maybe should have kicked in in Pompano Beach today where uh, we had some rain and lightning damage. Um, but bottom line, unless there has been a government declaration of a state of emergency, these won't kick in. So this is something you'll want to reach out to your attorney about during hurricane season, which we are fast approaching. And you're just going to want to understand what can we do, but make sure your attorney is providing hopefully their cell phone number so that they can act, actually be reached when these types of things come up. But it's basically a bunch of powers to, to protect the association from damage that is being caused, has been caused, or might be caused by the emergency that's been declared. Okay, so I'm going to skip the rest of that. You're welcome to look through it when you get the slides later on, but we need to save time somewhere, and that's one of the places we'll do it. I will say your emergency kit, have a pen and paper, disposable camera, walkie-talkies, and important vendor contact information written down somewhere, and all of that put in like a backpack, kind of like a go bag. Uh, the other thing I'll recommend that isn't here are... Um, external batteries for cell phones, for laptops, things of that nature, so that you can get access to information that you're going to need during those emergencies. Leasing amendments, effective July 1st, 2021. If you amend your governing documents to say you can't lease your property, it generally will only apply to the people that bought in after that went into effect. In other words, after the amendment was adopted and recorded, or who actually voted in favor of it. Okay. The difference effective July 1st of 2021 was that it now also apply, uh, applies across the board if it is for a term of less than six months that is restricted or renting no more than three times in a calendar year. Those types of restrictions apply to all of the owners, regardless of whether they voted for it or not. So leasing amendments are a little bit kind of a, a different animal than, than most others. Okay, uh, let's see. Amendments in general, a change of ownership under these statutes. You're basically, when you're considering a leasing amendment, you're going to want your attorney to review it. I don't want to waste your time with this right now because there's more important stuff we need to get through and we only have an hour left. Um, a licensed manager, a community association manager is required uh, when the work for management is done for remuneration, meaning they're being paid and not or and the association or association served are more than 50 units or have an annual budget in excess of $100,000. That's when your community manager needs to be licensed. To be clear, this is not when you need to hire a manager under Florida law. An HOA doesn't have to have a manager, you can self-manage. I recommend you, that you use a management firm or a licensed manager anyway, because frankly, it just makes life easier. But these are the times when you must have someone that is licensed if you're gonna hire someone to do the management for you. Uh, proposal to amend the governing documents contains the full text. So this is just the way that your attorney should be preparing proposed amendments. Essentially, if you're changing something and adding it, it's underlined. If you're taking something out, it's stricken. And if you are completely changing things around, you use this language, substantial rewording, see governing documents for current text. If you're amending it, it's effective when it's recorded in the county public records, not when you sign the piece of paper that says, yes, the members voted this in. Yes, the board is good with it. It is effective when it's recorded. So keep in mind, you may not be able to enforce that amendment for a couple days after it's been approved, even if you sign it and get it to your lawyer to record right away. The term governing documents does not include rules and regulations. The reason we mention this, and it's not in the slides, but the reason we mention governing documents and the fact that it doesn't include rules and regulations is because your governing documents, your declaration, bylaws, and articles of incorporation all need to be recorded under current Florida law. Your rules and regulations don't have to be. I still recommend it because that's going to place everyone on notice of what is going on in your community and what's required of them as members, visitors, tenants, et cetera, of your community. Okay, disputes. Um, there's a reason I got certified as a mediator. I did enough of these disputes on, on my own as counsel 
to justify the fact that I think mediation is a great process. Um, so we'll get into some of these disputes of, of what a dispute is. It's basically things that are subject to pre-suit mediation, meaning I have to send an offer to participate in pre-suit mediation and wait for the answer for 20 days before I can file my lawsuit for enforcement of your covenants. Okay, Use of or changes to the parcel. Okay, that's, that's covenant violations. Those are subject to pre-suit mediation. Amendments to the association documents, okay? Disputes about those things. Disputes about meetings of the board and committees appointed by the board. Disputes about member meetings, not including the election, which is subject to a separate process. And disputes about access to official records. So if someone sends a records inspection request, you don't respond, you need, they need to send an offer for pre-suit mediation before suing you to try and get those records or suing you to say, I'm entitled to my statutory damages. And then covenant enforcement, again, Disputes that are not subject to pre-suit mediation that go right to court, collection of dollars, anything enforcing a prior mediated settlement agreement. In other words, we already went to mediation. We don't have to go twice. Eviction or removal, because that's going to be a completely separate issue. Breach of fiduciary duty. And frankly, a lot of people will throw breach of fiduciary duty in there so they don't have to go to mediation. Uh, and then recall and election disputes. By the way, I mentioned they don't have to go to mediation. All I meant was on that particular claim of breach of fiduciary duty. My recommendation is still send the offer before you file the lawsuit, but the, the lawsuit that eventually will include the fiduciary duty claim is going to be filed all as one. The division has jurisdiction over HOA election recall disputes. That is a Florida government entity. Okay, pre-suit mediation procedure. Basically you send your letter, they have 20 days to respond, agreeing to use one of the five mediators that the person that sent the letter has listed. If they don't respond within those 20 days, that respondent has waived their right to recover attorney's fees and costs in any lawsuit that ensues based on that offer, even if they win the lawsuit. So what you're doing is waiving your right to your fees and costs by ignoring that letter. If they do respond and say, yep, I'll go to mediation, I'll pick this person, and they respond by certified mail return receipt requested, then you go to mediation. You basically go into a room and try and work it out with someone who is unbiased and is just there to try and get the parties together to resolve your dispute. If you don't settle, you reach an impasse during that mediation, then you can file your lawsuit. Okay, non-binding arbitration is really not something I suggest that the association use. So let's skip it. We can discuss it if the issue comes up. Uh, the enforcement process, the only thing to keep in mind, if any dispute involves more than $100,000 in damages, the association technically needs to get the affirmative approval of a majority of voting interests at a meeting of the membership where a quorum has been attained in order to file that lawsuit. Good news is you can get it after the fact, and it's a shield, not a sword, meaning that if the defendant tries to raise that issue, your response is, that has nothing to do with this vendor who I'm suing for $150,000. they are not a member of the community. They wouldn't be entitled to vote, so it doesn't matter. Or more likely, you go back to the members, get the vote, and report back to the court, and the case gets placed on hold for you know. 15, 30 days, whatever it is, until you can get that vote accomplished. Okay, official records. Bottom line, I'm going to skip ahead, and here's why. Number 13, what is included in the association's official records? All written records of the association that are listed or not specifically listed in the statute, which are related to the operation of the association. Those need to be kept for seven years, except board certification for five or as long as that person is on the board and bids. Okay, so basically you need to keep everything that comes into this association that's on paper in writing in any way, shape or form. Um, that's pretty much it. So keep in mind that includes each member's ledger. Each individual assessment ledger is something that is discoverable through that records inspection process. Okay, you're not going to provide the records unless someone requests it, but you are required to provide all of these records. There are certain things that are not subject to inspection, even though they're official records. We'll get into those in a minute. Okay, uh, election records do need to go and stay in the association's official records. 
Uh, this says a year. Candidly, I think it's actually seven in an HOA. This might be a carryover from our joint certification slide. So I apologize if that's inaccurate. You're welcome to email me if, frankly, I got it wrong. Um, so information you get in a gated community in connection with guest visits. In other words, when they swipe, if you're requiring them to swipe, which I don't recommend, um, their driver's license that gets added to the official records, but it's not subject to inspection and copying. And here is a whole laundry list of items that are not accessible to members, meaning they can send a request and you pull these documents out of the records that they're allowed to inspect when they ask to inspect the records. Anything protected by attorney, client, or work product privilege, information received in connection with the approval or lease sale or other transfer of a transfer of a unit, medical records, personnel records of the association or management, um, electronic security measures, in other words, passwords and and login credentials that are used by the association, because obviously you don't want your members all to have access to all of your data and have the ability to manipulate it. Software and operating systems used by the association that allows that manipulation of data, even if the owner owns a copy of the same software. So you're not required to provide that QuickBooks file. You provide a printout of the report created in QuickBooks instead. Uh, personal information that's listed in number seven here of the individual members that the association happens to have on file. Uh, the consent can be given where a member can say, no, it's fine for you to give out all of this information about me. I don't mind someone reaching out to me or having my social security number, which I don't get why you would consent to that, but members are allowed to consent to it. And then if you inadvertently disclose any of this information, in other words, oh, we thought we pulled all of this stuff out of our official records. We missed this one document that contains your social security number. If it was inadvertent and not just careless, then the association is not liable for that inadvertent disclosure. So it's another no harm, no foul. Attorney client privilege, um, basically anything that is communication with an attorney regarding potential or ongoing litigation is subject to the privilege and not subject to disclosure to anyone other than the board, management, and your attorneys until that lawsuit is over. I think that should be permanently because that lawsuit could be over, but another lawsuit could be filed about the same subject by somebody else or that same person that the lawsuit was resolved with can come back and challenge the judgment that you got two years later. Uh, but unfortunately, the way that it works right now, at least in my opinion, unfortunately, is that that privilege goes away once the threat of litigation is done. Now, only the board gets to waive that privilege. It's not the attorney that gets to say, well, I'm going to disclose that information. I think it's fine. The board needs to authorize that disclosure. The members don't get to do it. The manager doesn't get to do it. The attorney doesn't get to do it. It's only the board. So now we get into the official records request. This is another one. Get a policy in place before it's too late in writing, adopted by the board and in your official records. Okay, basically saying where the records are going to be stored and provided, how you can make the request, et cetera. But the bottom line is they need to be made available within 45 miles of the community or within the county. Doesn't matter which is large or smaller, just within one or the other. Uh, and provided within 10 business days after you receive the request. Now, keep in mind, when someone asks, I want to inspect these 20 records, okay, it's specifically the landscaping contract that we entered into with someone last week. All you're required to do is provide your records in the manner that they're maintained. You may want to make it easier if they're only asking for one document and it can be emailed or, or mailed out and say, this is in full compliance with your request. But if you're not doing it that way, all you have to do is allow them to sit and look at all of the boxes of crap, frankly, that you've got lying around that are the association's records. That said, I suggest digitizing all of those records and making them available if someone doesn't have a computer or a tablet or whatever and can't get access via email, then you can print them out. But frankly, I, I did this at, at a former law firm and we were able to get rid of an entire storage space. And when I say storage space, I mean 20 by 20 full of filing cabinets. That may be something your association can do. It may be less of an expense overall, even though your manager is going to charge you to scan those documents in. It may be less of an expense than having to store them directly in the management office or in a storage facility. It also means that most of the time, your response to these records inspection requests are, 
you can get this information via your login credentials on our website or via the management's website if one's maintained or here's a digital copy. Have a, have a nice day. We're done. Instead of you can come into this office on this time at this date and we will have all of our records carted over there for this inspection to take place. So just keep in mind, you know, if, if you don't provide this within the right amount of time, there is a reasonable, I'm sorry, a rebuttable presumption, meaning that you can prove otherwise, but there's a rebuttable presumption that you intentionally failed to produce the records and the other side, meaning the person that requested them is entitled to $10 per or $50 per day, up to $500 starting on business day 11, plus their attorney's fees and costs if they decide to file a lawsuit about this failure to produce the records. So bottom line, comply with the request. 10 business days, get the letter out saying, we will hold this inspection at this location within those 10 business days on this date at this time. If they don't show up, that's on them, okay? But you're gonna have the records available. If they say that time's not good for me, then they can try and reschedule it later or they can send another request. But you've done what you're required to do as an association. If you send back the, we're gonna be available in this office on this time at this date and it complies with the statute. Um, again, you can adopt rules regarding the frequency, time, location, notice, and manner of records inspections. Um, I strongly suggest that you do that. You can not require, by the way, that anyone state a reason for the inspection or show a proper purpose. It's just, I want to inspect the records. Okay, go for it. Pardon me, don't get yourself in trouble. Uh, you also can't limit an owner's right to inspect those records less than one eight-hour business day per month. You can say once every 30 days instead of per month so that you're not getting a request to inspect on the 30th and again on the 1st. Um, you know, you want to be pretty specific in those policies and your attorney should really be preparing that for you. By the way, I don't think I mentioned, but collection of assessments and covenant enforcement are two other policies I strongly recommend every single community in Florida have in place so that everyone knows what to expect when you're doing collection, when you're doing covenant enforcement. And they know that if they don't comply with those requirements, this is what's going to happen to them. We hope it doesn't, but if, if it becomes necessary, here's how we're going to proceed in almost every case. Uh, we talked about what happens if you don't provide it, $50 a day per calendar day for up to 10 days. We don't want that $500 gift to be paid out, so let's go ahead and produce the records. Faxes and emails, email addresses and fax numbers aren't accessible to other unit owners unless they're provided for notice requirements and the owner says you can disclose the information. No penalty for inadvertent disclosure like we discussed earlier. Contracts and bids, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, if it's not going to be performed within one year after the making of a contract for whatever you're doing, it needs to be made in writing. And anything that's for services needs to be a contract in writing, not oral. An oral contract is not enforceable for these types of things. Um, if the cost of whatever you're going to be contracting for exceeds 10% of the total annual budget, you need to obtain competitive bids. Um, you don't have to accept the lowest bid if, if you're contracting with some specific um, professionals. You don't need to get those bids. So a lot of communities choose to get bids for attorneys, engineers, things like that. You don't have to. Um, let's see. Any renewal is not subject to competitive bidding. That doesn't mean you can't do it anyway if the contract says you can terminate on 30 days notice. So you may need, if, if you need to give, let's say 90 days notice to terminate, you may need those competitive bids every year or every time that contract ends. Contracts with the manager, if made by competitive bid, can be made for up to three years at a time. Um, and an association that's governing documents provide for competitive bidding of services can operate under the provisions of the declaration instead of the statute if they're not less stringent, meaning that they require more than the actual statutory requirements. Okay, the following contracts are not subject to competitive bidding. Employees of the associations, attorneys, accountants, architects, basically professionals. And then also if they're the only source within the county, in other words, there's no other roofer within Polk County, I don't need to find another one. I can just work with the one that's located here. That may not be the best idea. You may want to find someone that's outside the county, but you're not required under the statute to find one. Um, we're bulk contracts. That's one. If you want to talk about it, reach out. But the bottom line is uh, these can be canceled just like a conflict uh, contract. 
by a majority vote of the voting interest present at the next regular special meeting of the association. So that's one big thing to keep in mind on bulk services, uh, bulk communication contracts. That's internet and things of that nature. Uh, let's see, we discussed that certain people don't have to be subject to these, um, these bulk contracts, usually regarding disabilities for the most part. And anyone that wants to use another provider can do it. They still might have to pay for the bulk contract, but you can't require that they use that contractor. Okay, assessments and foreclosure. This is actually what I started doing when I entered this industry in 2010 uh, with this firm actually. And um, you know the process, I'm just gonna be pretty brief because we're running low on time and I do wanna get to some of the Q&A and, and some more of the statutes that are being updated. Um, bottom line, this is usually going to be your most important covenant to enforce the obligation to pay assessments. And that's because without it, you've got no money. Uh, this is, this is where you get almost all of your cash to cover the costs. That's why it's coming directly from the budget or perhaps because it's coming directly from the budget. So the process is you have your budget, you send, uh, invoices out to everyone, letting them know when the assessments are due. If they, oh, by the way, if you're going to change your method of notice uh, of those invoices, every member needs now to actually approve the change or you need to continue sending it in the way that you did before. So if you used to send payment coupons and now all of a sudden you're sending a, a brief email that says, here's a breakdown of your annual assessment. If they don't agree to actually accept, uh, accept the notices that way, you may still need to send payment coupons to some of the members. So just keep that in mind. Um, if they don't pay on time and the account goes delinquent, effective 2021 in July, this new notice of late assessment was required. It's a 30-day letter that goes by U.S. mail without certified. Uh, the association can't require payment of attorney's fees in this letter, but you're basically, so that's why I recommend that your management company send this out in a form that your attorney can probably provide to ensure that that attorney is going to be willing to rely on those notices going forward. And that's a 30 day notice. It just gets sent to the owner and it basically says, hey, you're past due. Here's what you have to pay in the next 30 days. Otherwise, we're going to send you over to counsel and you'll end up being charged attorney's fees and costs in addition to interest and late fees if they might uh, come due. This also should be accompanied by an affidavit that says that it was mailed because that affidavit creates another rebuttable presumption like the one that we mentioned earlier about um, not having complied with a records inspection request. This rebuttable presumption is if it, there's an affidavit that says that this notice was mailed in accordance with the statute, that notice is deemed sent. So it's basically no one can argue that the notice wasn't sent. They can still argue that the form was incorrect, which is why we recommend that our, your attorney prepare the form for the management companies or the board's use, but they can't argue that it wasn't sent. There's really nothing they can say. They have no basis to argue unless there is no mailing label anywhere and there's no address anywhere on the letter or an envelope that was scanned in. Um, they're really not going to have any basis to argue whether or not this was sent. So the other required pre-suit notices, you've got an intent to file a claim of lien notice. That's basically a notice that says now you've got 45 days to pay these new amounts that are now due. And it's just an updated breakdown. If you don't pay it within this amount of time that we're providing, we're going to record a claim of lien against your property. And that claim of lien is a document that we actually record in the county public records that notifies everyone, hey, you know, this, this is a lien. We might foreclose this lien and this person may lose ownership of their property if this lien is not satisfied. Think about a mortgage. That's another lien that says dollars are owed on this property. That's basically what we have is a mini mortgage. Okay. And the reason that we're allowed to do that is frankly, because the statutes and the declaration will absolutely say it. And if they don't, then I hope that the association amends that because that's the reason that the association is allowed to go after someone's homestead uh, and is allowed to collect these assessments through damages and foreclosure. So we mentioned the intent to lien that sent certified mail. It includes attorney's fees and costs if any have been incurred. Uh, it might be that your management company sends that out before the lien's recorded. That will generally result in a lower cost, but it will avoid in most instances uh, being entitled to use some of the programs that attorneys offer. Ours in particular is basically, you know, you have um, us 
in exchange for a small annual fee. We're bearing all of the attorney's fees and costs that you incur in collection until that file is closed out. And if the amounts are paid by the owner, you never pay a penny in attorney's fees and costs for collection work. So these are things that the association, the board should be considering when deciding how to pursue collection and frankly, through whom, whether that's the manager or your attorney. Um, preferably both are involved in the, in the situation and they can work together, which is the best way to do it. But anyway, the notice of intent to file a claim of lien goes out. It literally says, if you don't pay, we'll file a claim of lien. Then you file the claim of lien. And then you have your notice of intent to foreclose the claim of lien, which is the final pre-suit notice. And it basically says, hey, if you don't pay this, we're filing a foreclosure lawsuit. We're going to try and you know have this house sold at a, an auction that is held by the court system. That's literally what foreclosure is. It's an auction by the court that if this, if you get your judgment in the case, presumably, and your judgment says, this is the amount that this person or these people owe the association. If they don't pay it by this date, a foreclosure sale of the property will be held either online or at the courthouse steps or in a room in the courthouse, et cetera. And it, that foreclosure sale is literally an auction of the property. If no one else bids on it or no one's willing to bid more than the association's owed, the association ends up with the property and what we call a deficiency judgment for the amount that wasn't bid compared to what the association was owed. If someone's willing to bid more than the association's owed, that's fantastic. That's the purpose of a foreclosure sale is to get some third party in who's going to pay off the association by paying the clerk of court who then sends all of the money the association's owed to the association the association gets a new owner in there who hopefully has enough funds to pay going forward and be a good dues paying member of the community. And then the old member is frankly removed from the property. So uh, that's the, the foreclosure process in a nutshell. Litigation always is going to be a little more complex than the way I'm describing it, but that's the, the you know, start to finish without including all of the day to day of an actual lawsuit. Now, things you might want to consider, interest and late fees. If you don't have interest stated in your declaration, or if it just says interest will accrue and not the amount of interest, in other words, the annual rate, you can charge up to 18% per year. Uh, late fees do need to be in the declaration or bylaws. The association can charge those late fees as the greater of $25 or $5 per installment. So keep in mind, I see very frequently that people are charging per month late fees, but they've got quarterly or annual assessments. It's per installment, not per month. So if you're charging $25 a month, but your assessment is quarterly, you're charging two to three late fees that technically you're not entitled to. And that gets back into these fair debt violations that we mentioned very briefly earlier. Uh, attorneys fees and costs, the association has a statutory entitlement to recover all of its attorneys fees and costs. And here's the biggie application of payments. So your the payments made by the owners actually get applied to attorney's fees and costs before the assessment, regardless of what the owner puts on that payment. So if they say this pays in full through whatever date, I couldn't care less. The statute says that that statement's irrelevant. I apply it to the account in this matter, first to interest, then if there are late fees to late fees, then to attorney's fees and costs, then to delinquent assessment. Now, when I say attorney's fees and costs, it's only the fees and costs incurred in collection. Whether bankruptcy and mortgage foreclosure fees are included there, my opinion is they should be because you might wouldn't necessarily be incurring those costs if it wasn't for the fact that there was a delinquent assessment, but it's gonna be up to any judge that's ruling in your foreclosure case, whether you can collect those amounts. First mortgagees who take title might be entitled to what's called safe harbor. In other words, the lender names the association in its foreclosure lawsuit, forecloses and actually takes ownership, just like I just described for the association foreclosing, the, the lender can do the same thing. Uh, if they take title and name the association in the complaint, they are only obligated to pay 12 months of unpaid assessments, if there's 12 months of unpaid assessments or 1% of the original mortgage debt, whichever is less. Keep in mind, these limitations only apply if the association was joined in the foreclosure, but they may be superseded by what's in the declaration as well. So this is, again, I'm sorry to say, it's going to be an attorney determination. One thing that is clear without your attorney getting involved, there is no right for a foreclosing, for the association to demand payment under case law in Florida and federally of the interest, late fees, attorney's fees, or costs that accrued 
before that foreclosure sale. Now, if that foreclosure sale resulted in surplus funds, meaning just like I described earlier, a third party purchased it, there's money left over after the lender's judgment is satisfied, the association can go after that money for the, other, for the interest, late fees, attorney's fees, and costs. But if you don't collect it through the, the surplus funds, you're not getting paid those amounts that came due, which is why some communities will actually say, if this account's in mortgage foreclosure, we're not moving forward with an assessment foreclosure as well. Some communities take a more aggressive approach. I don't really have a preference. I do like an aggressive approach in general to collection because there are times when a lender might take three years to foreclose and we take six months to nine months. That's not a guarantee. It's just something that I've seen happen in the past. Or the association takes title and rents the property out for two years, which I have two communities out in Brevard County that have been renting properties for more than two years because we were willing to take that additional step when the lender wasn't foreclosing right away. And that rental income just goes back to the association. So there are reasons that you might consider moving forward despite a mortgage foreclosure. You can't move forward despite a bankruptcy, but you're gonna to wanna to discuss with your attorney whether it's a good idea to proceed or not based on the stage of your collection process and the stage of the mortgage foreclosure action. Um, Lean priority, we can skip for now. Third party bidder liability. The owner is not jointly and severally liable for unpaid assessments that came due while the association owned the property. The owner that takes title is generally jointly and several, severally liable, meaning that it doesn't matter who pays between the previous owner and this new owner for all unpaid assessments, unless the declaration says that this individual is a third party beneficiary and that third parties who take title to this property at mortgage foreclosure sales don't owe the assessments. A lot of HOA declarations say that. It's an incentive for lenders to actually lend money. Don't be surprised if it's in there. You can be disappointed. You probably can't amend it out. And if you do, it'll only apply to mortgages that someone's actually willing to give without that provision after that amendment goes into place. Any existing mortgages, it won't apply. Okay. Acceleration of lender foreclosures. Basically, this says that there are actions that your attorney can take to try and move the lender's case forward if it is stalled or if it's just moving at a glacial pace. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in detail. If you have something going on that you want to move forward, that you're sick of the lender sitting around and doing nothing, talk to your attorney. They'll, they'll give you guidance on how you can move it forward. If they can't give you guidance because they don't know how, you might want to reach out to our firm. Uh, rent demands we talked about earlier. Tenant obligations and association remedies. Essentially, uh, if a tenant doesn't pay under a rent demand, you can evict them. I like that in rental communities because you're going to have a new tenant in there pretty quickly. That's another person you can send that rent demand to. If it's a not as desirable community, you're probably spending two, three grand or more on that eviction and not really getting anything out of it. So you might want to just let that go and try and collect from the actual owner. Uh, receivers and receiverships is a receiver is essentially someone that's appointed to take on the affairs of the association when the association can't govern itself. In other words, you don't have enough directors to actually run your community. Um, the cost of all of that is paid by the association. It's usually going to be an attorney that is the receiver and is going to charge their hourly rate to manage your community. Don't go into receivership. Do what you can to avoid it is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, let's see. We're going to skip the rest of that. Insurance. I get to skip an entire um, section or two sections of this whole thing. Um, insurance is one I'll skip other than to say, make sure that you're adequately insured. What that means depends on the size of your community and your risk tolerance. Talk to your manager, talk to your attorney about what you really think you're going to need to be fully insured and cover any claims that might come up. Uh, the Fair Housing Act, we have an entire seminar on this. This is the other one that I'm going to skip other than to say, if someone requests an accommodation of your rules and mentions any kind of disability, contact your attorney. This is another, um, I think I mentioned earlier, but this is another policy that you might want to put in place for your community to try and make sure that you're actually doing things the right way. There is a step-by-step -step procedure that needs to be followed with questions you can and can't ask. Um, Frankly, watch and get the slides if you can.
for our fair housing presentation. I think I did one about a month ago that was recorded. Uh, if not, I know Danielle Brennan of our firm did one fairly recently that is on our website. So look for that if you want more information. Or again, I've had plenty of people reach out about topics that have nothing to do with presentations I've done. I'm happy to try and answer those questions in a generic sense and not specific to your community whenever they come up. Uh, let's see, we're skipping this one. I know it's a big topic. I'm sure a lot of people have questions, but again, we have an entire hour and a half presentation on this. I think it doesn't do it justice to truncate it into a five to 10 minute discussion. And then we get into recalls, which I do see uh, not frequently, but it, it definitely happens. It's a very technical procedural matter. And as soon as one comes into the association, meaning someone has signed a recall petition or a group has signed a recall petition, and they're asking you to consider pulling someone off the board, which is what a recall is, you need to get that to your attorney that day. There are only five days, five business days for the association to call a board meeting and decide whether or not you're going to go ahead and say, yep, this person's off the board or just ignore it or say, you know what, we're going to fight this. We think it's invalid and here's why. OK, you don't have to be the one as a board that says we think it's invalid and here's why you do have an obligation to have the analysis performed of whether the recall ballots were properly completed, prepared, et cetera. OK, um, that review, I've seen literally multiple attorneys take all day for multiple days, which is why I say you want to get that to your attorney the day that you get it. And all of that is before litigation is filed. OK. Any member of the board, I want you to understand, this is not, hey, you're being pulled off for wrongdoing. This is, we think this other person would do a better job, or we just want this other person on the board. So a recall is not, you're terrible, we hate you, you are, you know, you're, you're stealing funds of the association and we want them back. This is, we just want someone else instead of you. It's nothing against the individual. It ends up feeling like it is, but it doesn't require any bad faith, any wrongdoing. It's literally just, we want this person in office instead of you, okay? It can be done by member meeting. Special member meeting to recall directors can be called by 10% of the voting interests giving notice of the meeting, which states, and, and that notice needs to state the purpose of the meeting. Electronic transmission can't be used, as I mentioned earlier, for giving notice of this particular meeting. And then you can do it by written agreement. A board a director can also be recalled, meaning removed from the board by written agreement of a majority of all voting interests without a member meeting. In other words, if a majority of the voting interests in the community deliver this notice to the directors or to the secretary or the manager, whoever is entitled to receive it, um, and, and this is needs to go by certified mail or personal service in the manner authorized for service of process, which we mentioned earlier, then that recall is immediately goes to the board. Instead of scheduling a member meeting, that's a board meeting within five days. So again, within five business days after receipt of the written agreements or after adjournment of the membership meeting, the board must hold a duly noticed board meeting with at least 48 hours posted notice. Again, you don't have a lot of time to do this stuff. Um, and the board meeting is held to determine whether or not to certify the recall, meaning to remove the director or not. The minutes of the meeting must state the date and time of the meeting, the board's decision, and a vote count taken on each board member sought to be recalled. So this isn't just we want one person, it's anyone that we want, and it needs to include we're replacing these X amount of people with the same number of people who are specifically listed in the recall petition. Uh, if the recall attempt is certified, it's effective immediately. The board member returns all uh, association records and, and property in their possession within five business days. If the board decides not to certify the recall within five business days, the board must file a petition. And I think this has actually changed where the board can, or if they don't, a member can go ahead and file the petition uh, with the division in accordance with the division's stuff. If the arbitrator certifies the recall, it's effective upon mailing of the final order of arbitration. And if the board doesn't hold the meeting, uh, the recall is deemed effective immediately at, at the expiration of the fifth business day. This is why this is so important. Uh, if the meeting is not held, the unit owner representative may file a petition uh, to challenge the board's failure to act. The petition must be filed within 60 days after the expiration 
of the five day period, five business day period. So keep in mind, you've got 60 days after that five business days expired, if you're the member who delivered the recall petition to actually file this arbitration. Now, keep in mind also, this, I don't think this is in the slides, but if this is going to be filed within 60 days before an election is scheduled, the, DB, the DBPR is going to dismiss the petition because it's pointless. They're not going to go through the entire administrative hassle of determining whether someone comes off the board when a new election is being held a month and a half from now. So that is just their across the board rule. Uh, if the board determines not to certify the recall or fails to certify board must file a petition for arbitration. And again, I, I believe someone's probably going to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the member can alternatively do this and that it is permissive on both ends to file or not file this arbitration petition. Okay. Um, and finally, anyone who's recalled may file a petition challenging the validity of the recall. So in other words, if I got kicked off the board, of course, that would never happen. It's me. Come on. But if it happened, I could file a petition with the division and do that within 60 days after the recall is deemed certified saying, I know the association decided not to back me, but I think this is garbage and I think they screwed up and I think that the petition's invalid and I should be put back on the board. Now, I know that this sounds absurd, but there are people who are desperate to be on a board of directors of an HOA in Florida. I don't get it. I, I give them a lot of credit. I thank them for their service. I don't understand it. But anyway, uh, okay, so here, number two here is where we mentioned that if there's 60 or less days until the scheduled re-election of the board, members sought to be recalled. Now, keep in mind, that includes if there are uh, staggered terms. So if that the election's coming up, but that person's scheduled to serve for another year plus 60 days, that petition will still be held because their election, that individual's election, is not being held within those 60 days. Okay, now, we are done with the materials. I don't know how I did it, but I got through it. Uh, I, I thank you to all of you who are still with us. Uh, and uh, I, I can't say any more than that. Just thank you for your time. We do have time now for some Q&A. Uh, I'm going to go through very briefly. We, we promised, and I keep my promises, as to some of the things that I didn't mention during the presentation, some of the upcoming changes to the statutes, I think I may have missed one or two. There are 14 pages for me to scan through real quick, so I'm going to do that. Uh, one is HOAs and flags, House Bill 437. Um, you can display up to two of the following flags, and frankly, they are the exact same flags that were already allowed, but now you can uh, put up to two. It can be one U.S. flag and one flag from that list from a freestanding flagpole. So instead of just being anywhere on your property in an HOA, you can fly up to two flags at any given time. And it, the statute will specify and does specify which flags we're talking about. It's basically the U.S. and Florida flags, uh, military flags for the U.S., POW, MIA, and any first responder flag. Now, the issue that we come across is, well, is the uh, blue line um, flag a first responder flag? My opinion is it probably is, and it probably gets allowed, but the problem is then you get into other pride flags, Black Lives Matter flags, and are you discriminating by not allowing those? They're not statutorily required to be allowed. I can foresee that eventually the Florida statutes will be amended to require that you allow those as well. Um, whether you wanna be known for discrimination, <laughs> I will leave that to your discretion, but I hope I don't have to be the attorney defending your decision to prohibit certain flags and allow others other than the ones that are allowed under this statute. Uh, let's see, we talked about the storage of items. Uh, let's see, House Bill 919. This is the HOA Bill of Rights. Board meeting notice agendas we mentioned, official records. Uh, you need to maintain email addresses. Um, you can now allow for removal of email addresses from the association's official records. Whereas before, if it was an official record, it stayed that way pretty much forever. Um, and it's, if an association collects a deposit from a member, including to pay expenses that may be incurred as a result of construction on the lot, uh, those funds need to be maintained separately and, and upon completion of the project, oh, and not commingled with any other association funds, 
Uh, the deposit needs to be returned within 30 days after the notice that the construction project or other reason for the deposit is done. And if the member makes a request for an accounting, you need to provide it within seven days after receiving that request. Uh, let's see, another prohibition on kickbacks. We already knew about it, but it basically criminalizes some of the things that were already criminalized under the condo statutes. Uh, immediate removal from office, forgery of ballot envelopes, theft or embezzlement. We already discussed a lot of this obstruction of justice uh, and destruction of or refusal to allow inspection or copying of official records for the purpose of hiding crimes is another crime in and of itself. Um, and we discussed the developer director issue. Uh, let's see. Just flying through this because we don't have a lot of time and I want to get to Q&A. Uh, let's see. We talked about all of this. There's a rebuttable presumption of a conflict of interest now. If any of the following occur without prior disclosure to the association, uh, you have a director, officer, or relative entering directly into a contract with the association, uh, director, officer, or relative holding an interest in a corporation that proposes to enter into a contract with the association. So... We also have fraudulent voting activities, uh, which are outlined as a misdemeanor of the first degree. I won't go into what they are, but that stuff's probably going to go into place on October 1st. Um, and then we've got fines. Association can levy reasonable fines. Notice uh, must be sent at least 14 days prior to the hearing committee meeting, and it can be sent to the member's designated mailing or email address so this is allowing notice of those meetings via email. Uh, the hearing before the independent committee will be mandatory, not optional. So I said, as of now, there's question as to whether or not it's required. It is questionable now. It is mandatory. And again, the good practice is to start requiring the actual meeting, not just notice of the opportunity for a meeting right away. And then the notice needs to describe an actual, uh, contain an actual description of the violation, what they need to do to cure the violation and the date and location of the hearing, rather than just, you know, we're having a violation hearing, you're going to be on the docket, so to speak. Uh, they have the right to attend by phone or other electronic means, making it easier for people to actually show up and contest the potential fines. After the hearings, the committee needs to provide written notice basically saying, hey, you know, we this is what we found and here's why. Uh, and then clarifications provided again that the independent committee's actions must be approved by majority vote of its members. So unless your governing documents specify, that does not need to be a unanimous vote of that committee. Okay, I'm going to take a breath, let Jeff and potentially Heather and Jose take over for a minute, and we'll get to it. the Q&A. Have a glass of water. <laughs> Yes, uh, we'll do a couple of uh, Q and A's. Thanks, Alan. Great job as always. And um, but before we get to the Q and A, uh, I'll briefly go over the evaluation and also how you can print your certificates right now. I see a few questions in the Q and A about that, about whether you can get your certificates of attendance and the slides. So I will show that to you right now. I will once again place the link I'm about to talk about into the chat. So go ahead and into the chat area, you'll see the link there. Click on that link and it is going to take you right here. Once you click on the link, this page will open up. If you have a company filter, somebody said that their company is not allowing the, the window to pop up, you can copy and paste that link and send it to yourself to another email address and do it that way. So go ahead and fill out this evaluation. It's not as daunting as it looks. It goes very, very quickly. You submit it. After you submit it, the confirmation screen looks like this, okay? And there's two things you want to do here, two things. Under this yellow shaded box, you can click here to print your certificate, your attendance certificate, which a few of you asked about. Your printer dialog box opens up, then you go ahead and print it out or save it as a PDF if you have that option on your computer. Last resort, you could also take your smartphone and take a picture of it. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be a piece of artwork. It just needs to be a file that is uh, either saved digitally or in a filing cabinet in your board's office, your management office, or similar. And then also at the bottom of this page, right underneath that, you can see here, a copy of the slides used for today's presentation can be found here. So click here, and then the slides open up. You can go ahead and print those, save those, and um, 
file them for referring back to a little bit later on. Hopefully I've answered your questions on that. There'll also be a follow-up email tomorrow at this time. Uh, well, I should say at the start time at about 5.30 Eastern, you'll get an email, all of you who attended, to the email address you use to register. In that email, of course, it'll thank you for attending. There'll also be the link for the evaluation that we just went over. Not, not the certificate. The certificate will not appear in an email tomorrow. The same link we just spoke about will appear in that email tomorrow that you click on the link and it takes you to the page that we were just explaining right here. Alan, Heather, back to you both. All right. Thank you everyone um, for joining. So we do um, have a couple questions. Alan, I don't know if you wanna kind of skim through here sure. um, to see which ones maybe you haven't addressed and just kind of address those for everybody before we hop off. Yeah, we can do that. Um, will we provide a copy of the materials presented? Uh, yes, we already did. Or at least Jeff just explained it. Do fines by the committee need to be unanimous or will two of three votes count for enforcing or not enforcing a fine? I literally just answered that with the new statute. So um, thank you, Cam Patters. Follow up, do fines need to be spelled out in the FAB or is this an arbitrary number defined by the board? The better way of doing it is to actually have the dollar figure in either your governing documents or your rules and regulations, preferably in a specific covenant enforcement policy. The way that I've seen people successfully doing it is if you have different dollar figures for different violations, you just have a chart. My preference is you have the same dollar figure across the board. And if you violate and you get fined, you violate and you get fined. And it's X dollars, up to $100 per day for ongoing violations uh, up to 10 days. Now, the other thing that I didn't mention earlier, but I will mention now that I suggest that your covenant enforcement policy do, and it's something the way that I draft my covenant enforcement policies all the time that a lot of people don't seem to do, make a multiple uh, fines. In other words, if you get fined for the same violation three times in a year, that automatically gets treated as a nuisance under your policy, regardless of whether it qualifies as one under your governing documents. Now you've got an enforcement mechanism. Now you've got a violation that's worth pursuing through the covenant enforcement process that I described earlier. Whereas leaving your trash out one time, if you send that to a lawyer, I don't know what to tell you. You're, you're just wasting your money. You're throwing your money away. But if you've got it three, four times through the course of a year, and it becomes an ongoing issue at that point, then it's worth getting someone involved that's going to take it a step further than management's letters that go out. And a lot of people, unfortunately, um, are too non-diligent is the word I'll use to be a little kinder than I want to be, um, but, but they ignore the letters. And a lot of people will not ignore a letter from an attorney, even though they'll, for some reason, think that management's letters are not still part of that same process that the attorney is just continuing. Um, so let's see, let's move on. Will terminating reserves be allowed going forward in 2024 based on the new Florida laws? My understanding is that reserves will be mandatory. That's in condos only. So if you're in this class and you're in an HOA, the HOAs do not have mandatory reserves at all. None of those statutory, statutory changes pertaining to reserves apply to any HOA in Florida, unless you somehow have condo buildings within your HOA, in which event only those condo buildings will be subject to those laws. So if you're in, let's say, you know, a, a multi-condo that's governed by an HOA, that's the only way that you'll be subject to it. And the HOA itself won't be, but the condo, un, I'm sorry, the condo buildings will likely be subject to those new laws. So the HOA itself, I, I can't think of an instance where the HOA would be subject to any of those new reserve requirements. Okay, next question. If board members get together to discuss prospective agendas, necessary assessments, budget amounts, et cetera, does that constitute an effective meeting or merely discussion among directors? If it's a real meeting, does it have to be an open meeting for all members to attend? So there are a couple different things that are listed in that. Frankly, the good news is that I don't think any of those is a board meeting unless you are making the final decision as to what that budget is going to entail and voting it in. When the board is voting, the board is making decisions. That's when it becomes a meeting. 
you're discussing association business, questionable. Most of the time, my opinion is that's not probably a board meeting because the purpose of a board meeting is to have a full discussion and vote. So if you're going to do that discussion in advance of holding a board meeting, just hold the same discussion over with the members present and you'll have covered everything that you need to do. You'll have the same level of transparency that you're required to have under Florida law. Um, there's a little bit of risk that that might be considered a, a board meeting, but I just don't see it as a major risk. If assessments are raised for a specific project and exceed the final cost of the project, can that excess be used for general operating purposes or maintain in a reserve account in a pooled reserve fund for any and all future projects, capital improvements, et cetera, is refunding the excess an option? And they requested that I say no, and I will. Generally speaking, if you have a special assessment and you had it for a specific purpose, that's the only time that I would say you may have an obligation to return the funds if it ended up costing less than you anticipated. The likelihood is it's going to cost more than you anticipated, no matter what you budgeted for. So you're rarely going to have that risk. When it comes to a specific project, if, if it's in your reserves, that extra money just stays in your reserves. You don't need to return it to anyone. Uh, if it's part of your maintenance assessments, it doesn't need to be returned to anyone. The only time you would really have that issue arise where you have more money that you've collected than necessary and you might have some form of obligation to return any of it, which I still think you probably don't need to, is if it was done via special assessment. But if it's part of your regular maintenance, part of your reserves within your regular maintenance, you just keep the money in the association's account. You use it for what the association needs. And just to kind of um, elaborate on that from our side of things, um, we found that um, if the association is refunding for, let's say, surplus um, funds is what we would call it, um, sometimes the membership has that expectation um, going forward. So you don't want to set that precedent. Um, so we say that if you have a surplus or we recommend that you just kind of keep it um, in your operating and, and don't get into the habit of doing that refund. Very good point. I appreciate it. Um, okay. If the, and by the way, I wholeheartedly agree. You don't want to set that precedent of anytime we have extra money, it's going to come back to you. You want to set the precedent of anytime we have extra money, we're going to maintain the community the way that we should have in the first place. Um, okay. If the previous board voted to have seven members on the board, in other words, we have seven directors and one resigned, do we need to fill the open seat if we can still meet quorum? Well, I think it's a good idea to fill the open seat primarily because now you've got an even number of directors, which means that any time that you have an even vote, you won't be able to finalize any decisions of the board. We don't really like that. We like to have productive board meetings that result in final decisions. And so you're going to want that extra director. The alternative is ask someone else to drop off, change the number to five via whatever your bylaws require, and only require the five going forward. Now, when you're asking about can you still meet quorum, the answer is, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't, your, your quorum when you have seven directors is four. You can still have four there if you have six directors. And frankly, if you only have six, even though you're supposed to have seven, your quorum is a majority of those six. So technically, you still need four. So easy answer to that one. Hopefully, that answers the question. Um, and I like to throw a little extra tidbit in there. Hope that helped, too. Can you please advise on minutes? Do we need to talk only the items that we vote on? Just trying to clarify, thanks. Anything that you voted on is what should go in the meeting minutes and how each individual director voted. Um, that's pretty straightforward, easy. We've, um, we've seen where some managers or, and I think it was board driven, um, they've put a lot more into meeting minutes. And unfortunately there can be circumstances where that becomes um, sort of incriminating information for the association. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was meeting minutes that I've seen where um, it talks about um, balconies in an association. And at some point, um, there was a discussion on the condition of the balconies. Well, no one on the board, um, nor the membership um, that were present, were um, trained or certified to really make the decisions um, that a subject matter expert would need to make. So when they're making statements about um, the community balconies are severely deteriorating and um, you know this is creating a, a life safety issue or anything like that, and that gets put into meeting minutes, 
well, that's an official record now, um, and that couldn't be used. Um, and, and again, those weren't subject matter experts speaking on that, but they put their opinions into the meeting minutes and that becomes a record. So we want to be careful about those things um, as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing that I'll point out along the same lines of what Heather's describing is if you put some opposition opinions in because you want to give a narrative instead of giving a vote, which is what's required, you're basically pointing out that other people have told you what you're doing is wrong. So when someone else comes to sue you, you can't say, well, you know, we thought what we were doing is right. Their, their response, whether it's legally significant or not, is going to be, look in your own meeting minutes. Someone told you that you shouldn't do this and you did it anyway. So it's, it becomes an issue of knowing and willful versus making a board decision that's in their best business judgment. Um, so I, bottom line, the only thing that should go in minutes is what was decided and how it was decided. And again, only the motion, not a discussion, not a paragraph about each item. It's the board voted to hire Empire as their management firm. John made the motion, Jane seconded the motion, these five people voted this way or the vote was unanimous in favor. That's it. That's your whole, for, for purposes of that item, that's it. The only other thing that you might put on there is how each agenda item was addressed without a board vote. That's the only other thing that I would suggest putting on there. And you might put on there, you know, we had 15 agenda items, three of them we didn't get time to get to because this jerk was complaining the entire time and he wanted to use his full three minutes on every agenda item. So we didn't have time. That's the, and, and don't put jerk in your meeting minutes, by the way. But, you know, that's the general idea. Unless you're serving jerk chicken, that that's different. Yeah, that, that, that could delay a little bit. I can understand that, <laughs> that being problematic. Uh, we have a somewhat small HOA. One of the board directors was doing irrigation and the HOA was paying him. Is this not allowed? That's a conflict. Whether it's a bad conflict, I don't know. It just depends whether you gave the disclosures and had the meeting and, and had the small board vote in the way that's required under Florida law that I described earlier on. That's it. It's, it's not necessarily bad to have a conflict of interest. You might get a great deal because Jane's cousin happens to run a landscaping company and is, and is going to give you a great price. A conflict isn't necessarily bad. It just needs to be disclosed and treated in the statutory manner. Uh, can you please repeat the change and clarify as to what an HOA can or can't do regarding ARC guidelines in the backyard areas, visible or not visible come July 1st? Basically, you can't govern anything that is not visible from outside the lot by July 1st. That's, I, I, I'm very much oversimplifying, but that is the obnoxious statute that's about to go into effect. Can we um, go a bit further? Because I've kind of touched on this um, with some of the managers and the questions arise, which I'm sure everybody's going to have these questions. Um, well, what if I have a, a neighbor that's on the second story? Well, then it's visible in the backyard or or whatever the case is. If I walk up to the fence and I can look over, um, you know, so can you maybe give your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I can give an opinion whether it's worth anything or not is going to depend on a judge's decision down the road. But the bottom line is my opinion would be that the association doesn't have the ability to see from that neighboring lot. So the the neighbor would be the one that has to file that lawsuit, that enforcement action on behalf of their themselves. Um, you know, and, and then we deal with situations where, okay, well, what about if it's visible across the lake and it still happens to be in the same HOA, but it shouldn't be visible is, or if it's in another community and it's visible, how, how does the statute play out? It's really going to come down to what does a judge decide? But the specific example you gave Heather, my opinion is it's probably going to be the responsibility of that neighboring owner which by the way, neighbors are allowed to enforce the declaration just like the association in almost every instance when it comes to covenant enforcement. So that neighbor would send the offer for pre-suit mediation potentially. I don't think that's the proper subject of the offer because it's not association versus owner, it's owner versus owner. But that owner, that neighbor would be the one that's obligated to actually file that lawsuit. Sorry, sometimes I think out loud. Um, is there a requirement that the association allocate 10% of revenues through the reserve account? If your bylaws say so, yes. If, or if, you're, if your governing documents or a member vote 
has established that reserve, yes. If not, you don't have to have any reserves at all. I'm not saying it's a bad idea to have them, but there's no statute that says that an HOA has to have any reserves whatsoever. Uh, the past board signed a loan contract for a number of projects in the HOA. One was for a front gate. We can't have a front gate. We're being told that the money set aside for the gate must go untouched and possibly used for a partial payment toward the loan. We're already paying the whole loan amount. So can we get the money back or credited to our accounts now? They held aside 65,000. Um, that might be a claim against your former director and then possibly in involve your directors and officers liability insurance company. To, that, that's one of those I'd have to sit down and look at the exact facts and circumstances before I can give any kind of remote semblance of an opinion, because there's a lot that goes into whether you can go after anyone for this and who you can go after. Um, frankly, the problem becomes you might be going after yourself for all intents and purposes, because you're suing a former director or the former board who is then going to invoke your own insurance policy to defend them. Uh, I dealt with one of those and settled it out just a couple months ago. And you know the, the response was, why are you suing yourself? So whether you want to pursue that or not is, is really up to the board. Um, it's something that our firm does, albeit rarely. Uh, it's something that I've done, albeit rarely, but it is something that you know you should have some attorney giving at least a little bit of input as to what your rights might be, if any, to address the issue. Um, okay, can three members of five of the board remove the management company without the president's knowledge? Without the president's knowledge, no, to the extent that that becomes an official record of the association. If you're sending termination letters, signing contracts with a new management firm, et cetera, um, three of the five members of the board can technically vote to terminate the management contract. What you're going to want to do is make sure that if you are terminating, that you are complying with all the termination provisions of the management contract and that you're not going to be subject to enormous damages for terminating that contract early instead of letting it play out for the end of its expected term. Um, and that is something that you're going to want to run by your association's attorney so that they can give you direct guidance on the specific terms of your individual contract with your individual management company. But the bottom line is you can do it without the president's involvement, but if you're going to do it, it needs to be decided at an open board meeting anyway, unless you are involving counsel, but there's nothing that says unless the president is a member of that management company, there's nothing that says you can have a closed board meeting without the president attending unless the president isn't also a director because your community operates a little wonky. Um, and those communities do exist, but they're rare. Most of the time, the officers are also directors, but it's not necessarily required. Um, I think that's, I, I know Oscar got back into the question about um, the new statute that says you can't govern anything in the backyards, et cetera. Uh, talks about pergola roofs, playset roofs above six feet, et cetera. Same answer. It's just going to depend on whether or not it's visible from outside the lot. That really is what it comes down to. Um, and again, it's up to a judge. Um, and thank you for Luciano Guidari. Um, not a question, positive comment. Really like the presentation, very informative. That's because Heather and Jose did such a fantastic job. Um, so I think that's all we have. And we literally have one minute until we were scheduled to end. So I just want to say thank you again to Heather and Jose uh, for having our firm, K Bender Rambam participate today and provide some education for some of your people and some of our people. Uh, hope to get the opportunity to do this with you guys again. You know how I feel about both of you personally and professionally. And thank you to Jeff for your help as well. Heather, Jose, you got anything you'd like to add? Um, I just want to say thank you to you, Alan, and Jeff as well. Um, you always do a great job, and I know that I personally learn um, a lot each time that um, you know we're together and, and either chatting or attending these things. Um, I'm happy to put my contact information in the chat um, for anybody that would like to reach out or have any questions for us at Empire. Um, I'm happy to take those. All right. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful job all around. Thanks for getting to all the questions. That is uh, outstanding. And uh